Majority Report with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report. With Sam Cedar. <laughs> and I get the feeling you've been cheated. It's Thursday, January 23rd, 2020. I'm Michael Brooks. This is the five time award winning majority report. We're broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On today's program, Paul Heidman, author of a new piece in The Jacobin, The Third Way is the Past, Socialism is the Future. What really represents the future of our politics, the death of the third way, but also its history in the 90s and how we actually reverse global far-right authoritarianism. And speaking of which, Bernie Sanders is surging, folks. WBUR poll shows Bernie with a 12-point lead in New Hampshire. 29 points to 17 points for Mayo Pete. 14 points for Joe Biden. Even as a new Newsweek poll shows Bernie Sanders with the largest head-to-head lead over Donald Trump of anybody in the Democratic field. In fact, most Democrats are leading Donald Trump with a couple of big exceptions like uh, the New York Times loved Amy Klobuchar. She's trailing Trump by five points. Polling indicates that Trump and Biden may come to regret convincing America that Bernie Sanders is honest and uncorruptible and most other people will regret the fact that that's apparently what he is Sanders wins the California the California's uh, wins into the endorsement of a major California union upping his lead among union endorsers another day of the impeachment trial as Democrats continue to assemble a convincing case and Zoe Lofgren has to explain that keeping a document classified cannot just be to avoid embarrassment. What? Narrow majority of Americans now support removing Donald Trump from office. San Francisco DA Chase Bowden ends cash bail for all criminal cases and a significant victory for justice. Texas, thousands of kids are losing Medicaid coverage each month. Donald Trump opens the door for cuts in Medicare and Social Security because guess what? He's a Republican. And because he's also a Republican, the Trump administration moves to get rid of restrictions and controls on stream- to protect streams and wetlands in a boon to developers following the lead of Maryland's environment-destroying Republican governor. CIA psychologist defends torture before a Guantanamo court. And Chinese cities cancel New Year's celebrations in an effort to stop a virus outbreak. The UK Tory government and parliament have voted against a measure protecting children, ref- child refugees. Barbarism is global. And the Germany urges Bolivia's next leader to revive a lithium deal, which was in doubt before the coup that removed Evo Morales, one dead and seven injured in downtown Seattle after a shooting incident, all that, and much, much more on today's Majority Report. So the polls are looking really good. Um, And I would, and this poll, this is the, uh, we'll get to this later, but this 
poll that was just put out by WBUR, which is the um, basically Southern New England, Boston-based NPR regional station. This is significant. Um, this is putting Bernie with a 12-point lead and Biden falling to third um, by a couple points behind Buttigieg. Uh, and then obviously, and then we have Warren at 13, we have Klobuchar at six, we have Gabbard at five, Yang at five, Steyer at two, Bloomberg at one, and former two-term neighboring governor Deval Patrick at one. Uh, and this is interesting because I would say here, not only is Bernie opening it up, but if Gabbard and Yang don't stay at 5% and those votes go and those uh, voters vote, I'm assuming those would probably go to Bernie. If there's 1% or 2% of Warren voters that are committed to some type of actual sort of progressive agenda and they see the tea leaves, they'll break for Bernie too. Uh, so this is very encouraging. And it comes on the heels of this argument that they're having about Social Security, which is incredibly important. Now, we and Sam outlined this very well yesterday. For decades, Joe Biden has advocated for cutting Social Security and Medicare. Uh, he flirted with a balanced budget amendment as well. He has been somebody who uh, has, along with building his political brand in the 1980s by assembling the prison industrial, being a major assembler of the prison industrial complex, an architect of the war on drugs and other class and racist uh, prison and policing policies. He was somebody who really wanted to prove his bona fides by cutting social, by being, by being a Democrat who was willing to immiserate American seniors and assault the legacy of the New Deal. And again, Obama and Biden put vicious cuts on the table, which the only reason they didn't go through was because uh, Republicans, you know, didn't want a deal that was 75% on their terms. They wanted 100%. And, you know, ideally an apology for Obama being African-American, right? Like this was the Republican Party that they were dealing with and obviously we're still dealing with. Um, these are some Google search terms, which they've stayed steady. They spiked, what is this, January 18th? Uh, yeah, starting January 18th. Yeah. But the story stayed alive, Biden, uh, Social Security. And what's also interesting, if you look at the sub-region trends, District Columbia is number one, obviously, then Vermont, Iowa, number three, uh, Oregon, Delaware, and then we go to the next page. Number six is New Hampshire. So, so these are great. And it, look, I mean, it's great because, of course, I think heading into the last you know couple of weeks here, and Sanders and Biden arguing about Biden's history of advocating cuts to Social Security when Biden's strongest demo is older voters, great. Uh, secondly, it matters. It's important policy. We need to not only not cut it, we need to expand it like Bernie Sanders advocates. And third, this is going to be a big problem in the general election but maybe a little bit less of a problem than I had thought a couple of weeks ago or even a couple of days ago. And of course, another huge opportunity if we're wise enough to nominate Bernie Sanders. In 2016, Donald Trump had the sense to lie his ass off about Medicare and Social Security. We're not gonna cut it, you can't cut it. Now, anybody who knew anything knew, of course, A, he's lying. And of course, Donald Trump is fundamentally untrustworthy on everything besides racism and personal enrichment, but also uh, Paul Ryan himself, Paul Ryan, who was the, you know, his whole purpose in public life was give money to rich people, immiserate middle class, poor and working people. And he said in 2016, don't worry about what this guy says on the campaign trail. We're going to have the same congressional agenda. And of course they did with the massive wealth giveaway in 2017 to the rich, which Trump still brags about. And they have been trying. They tried to gut uh, the achievements of Obamacare. And of course, Medicare and Social Security have steadily been on the blo chopping block, as well as, you know, vicious policies towards uh, food stamps, which the Trump administration has also pushed. So this is an enemy of working people because Donald Trump is a Republican. And it seems now, and we'll listen to some of the, you know, the gibberish and nonsense mumbling here from Trump. Uh, in this clip on CN CNBC, but the, the major takeaway of this is that Donald Trump now sounds a lot more like Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan, which is 
both more transparent, should be obvious to everybody, and it's a great electoral opportunity for someone with a clear record on Social Security. This is can be a major political advantage. If you nominate Joe Biden, you're going to muddle it the hell up because Donald Trump will lie and lie and lie and lie and lie and lie. The press won't cover it po uh, properly, and Joe Biden's record's compromised. Now, Bernie Sanders, with a clear record on Social Security, and yes, I know they dug up some quote from the mid-90s where Bernie said the program might need some adjustments. Bernie Sanders is definitely almost a thousand percent talking about lifting the cap on wealthy people getting taxed to fund Social Security. He's his or name more generous inflation adjustments. Or generous inflation adjustments. He fought against chain CPI when Obama proposed it. He fought against every single deal to cut it and has been on record supporting expanding it. So Please, but let's not do the bullshit. This could be a good Bernie campaign ad. I dare. One last question. Go ahead. Entitlements ever be on your plane? Uh, at some point, they will be. We have tremendous growth. We're going to have tremendous growth this next year. It'll be toward the end of the year. The growth is going to be incredible. And at the right time, we will take a look at that. You know, that's actually the easiest of all things, if you look, because it's such if a If you're big willing percentage. to do some of the things that you said you wouldn't do in the past, though, in terms of well, Medicare. Well, we're going to look. We also have uh, assets that we never had. I mean, we never had growth like this. We never had a consumer that was taken in through d different means over $10,000 a family. We never had the kind of... Uh, the kind of things that we have. Look, our country is the hottest in the world. We have the <laughs> hottest economy in the world. Uh, we have the best unemployment numbers we've ever had. African-American, Asian-American, uh, Hispanics are doing so incredibly best they've ever done. Uh, black, best they've ever done. African-American, the numbers are incredible. The poverty numbers, the unemployment Positive. and the employment. I don't know if he does he think African American and black are different things. Is he? I don't. I don't know. Uh, that's his stat. We don't need to hear the rest of it. I mean, obviously, he's just going to go on and ramble on. But this is a good preview of the general election. If you're Bernie Sanders, you can seize on that and run circles around him because absolutely, as it is always the case with Republicans, Social Security is on the chopping block. But Social Security could definitely also be on the chopping block with Joe Biden. And then the second part, when you start getting into a game about the economy. It's going to take somebody like Bernie Sanders to say, well, let's get real here. Skyrocketing inequality. Millions of Americans working multiple jobs just, just to survive. A new temp economy, which is downwardly mobile, low paying, health care, more and more out of reach for people. This is the real state of the economy. And by the way, this was the real state of the economy that you lied about doing something about in 2016. If you're, you know, Biden, again, it gets more tricky because what are you going to do? You're going to say, well, you know, look, yes, Obama did. He got us out of the recession and so on. But those, those, the, the bragging of the Obama record is more analogous to what Trump is bragging about, right? Which is that there is some, there is conventional economic growth. There has been for several years now. Now, of course, we could go into recession. We could have, you know, there could be major economic problems on the horizon. But you need somebody with the credibility to talk about the real state of the economy for most people in this country. And it ain't so rosy as most people know in their actual experience, regardless of the numbers. So I would love to, instead of running against 2016 economic con artist Donald Trump, let's run against Republican establishment Donald Trump. Let's run against Mitt Romney, except bloated and with weird skin and odd comments about his daughter. I'm into it. I'm ready for that race. Let's run it. You're getting nervous, man. Calm down. It's okay. <laughs> Shut up, Vic Berger. Shut up, Vic Berger. <laughs> Capping off the closing argument segment on the uh, before as we as we rocket towards Iowa and New Hampshire here. Valentine's Day is special, but it's only one day. Luckily, there's something that can help make it date night all throughout the year. I'm talking about Hunt a Killer, an activity that you can experience with a loved one every month. Roll up your sleeves and work together to solve a realistic murder mystery. Hunt a Killer thrusts you and your friends and family into an ongoing murder mystery investigation. The game brings people together by challenging them to decode 
to decode ciphers, examining clues, and solve puzzles. It's like an escape room delivered right to your door. Hunt a Killer has 2,000 five-star reviews on Trustpilot, and Fast, Com and Fast Company named them as one of the most innovative entertainment companies of 2019. Plus, part of the proceeds of every box goes to the Cold Case Foundation. Sam raves about this on a daily basis. I haven't an opportunity to play it yet, but I definitely plan to. Sam raves about it. He talks about how it's bringing him and particular, you know, he's, he's got a teenage daughter. She's out doing her life. She wants, you know, she doesn't necessarily want to hang out with Sam. Uh, but this game is so enticing and so fun and such a great activity that it's an awesome bonding exercise and they're having a great time. Literally, I mean, Brings the guy like clear joy. Talks about it off air. It's awesome. Right now, just for our listeners, you can go to huntakiller.com slash majority and use promo code majority at checkout for 20% off of your first box. Huntakiller.com slash majority for 20% off to show support for our podcast. That's huntakiller.com slash majority. We will be right back with Paul Heidman. Mm -hmm.
Welcome back to the Majority Report. Joining us now is Paul Heidman. He's a PhD candidate in sociology at the New York University, and he's also the author of The Third Way is the Past, Socialism is the Future, a new column for Jacobin Magazine. Read it online. Check out the link on the homepage. Paul, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. It's my pleasure. So, Paul, I guess uh, for those of us who are not uh, 90s kids, uh, <laughs> it defined the third way for us. So the third way was a political project that really began to cohere in the 1980s, uh, most notably in the United States and in the United Kingdom. And um, I think it, it's important to be clear that the third way is a, a kind of centrism, a certain centrist political project, but all, all centrists are not the third way. Um, so, so in the piece, I, uh, the piece is kind of charting the rise and fall of a, of a very specific centrist political project in the 19, in the 1980s that, that really came to hegemony in the 1990s in those two countries, in the U.S. and the U.K. Um, and in both countries, the third way was a project of uh, centrists in the Democratic Party and the, and the Labor Party. Um, that saw the the kind of job, their their task of modernizing those parties. Both parties were thought to be kind of clinging to past dogmas about the welfare state, um, things like that about you know uh, regulation. Um, and and the partisans of the third way argued that uh, this was not appropriate for a world undergoing globalization, uh, things like that. There was all you know they're they're really obsessed with a kind of Thomas Friedman esque. Right vision of uh, this kind of exploding globalization, modernization, changing everything. We have to rethink everything, um, all of that kind of stuff. So, and this is the, uh, again, I mean, the most prominent leaders representing this would be Bill Clinton and Tony Blair. But yes. just to be clear, I mean, would you say if we wanted to broaden it out, and I know that it isn't just the center, it is a particular project, but would it be fair to say Obviously, the other other prominent leaders in the 90s that would kind of fit would be everybody from, you know, Tabo and Becky, Gerhard Schroeder, Enrique Cardozo, uh, maybe Massimo Dilema. But then uh, moving forward, even though they use a very different rhetoric, would it be fair to kind of also slot Justin Trudeau, Macron, Barack Obama, Joe Biden, Hillary Clinton in this as well? <laughs> So yeah, that's a that's a staggering array of political history right there. Yes. Um, I, I think I, I think I would tend to kind of limit the third way to the attempt to chart out a new path for parties that had you know some kind of attachment to social democracy. Mm -hmm. So like um, you know I mean obviously in the U.S. with the Democrats that's a complicated question. But um, both in, if you take the U.K. and the U.S. as kind of paradigmatic examples, the rise of like third wave politics was all about our parties used to be about this. Now they need to be about something different. Now they need to be about opening up markets. They need to be about modernizing. They need to be about competition, right? Like these need to be the watchwords of our parties. And so I think someone like Schroeder in Germany, mm -hmm. um, you know, that, that, that can definitely apply to. But I'm, I'm a little more hesitant, especially for someone like uh, Macron, okay. who, um, you know, is kind of this sui generis figure um, that is pretty plainly not going to leave any kind of institution behind when he is finally kicked out of office, you know? Um, and so, so I think, I think it's most helpful to see the third way as, as an attempt to reorient these political parties away from any kind of attachment to, uh, to the labor movement, um, to institutions of the welfare state, things like that. And in, and in the U S and UK example, it was also attached to a quite muscular foreign policy as well. Right. So, yeah, can you, just to really nail this down, can you give a few examples, uh, you know, maybe one each, uh, you know, either sure. from, from the UK yeah. and the US that kind of, but just um, are, are emblematic of domestic and foreign policy in the third way? 
Yeah, so, so in the United States, the third way is really institutionalized in the Democratic Leadership Council, which uh, is built in, is kind of uh, formed in the 1980s um, as, a, as a conscious attempt to move the Democratic Party to the right. Um, after the uh, Reagan's success, uh, after uh, Nixon's success and Reagan's success, uh, electoral successes in particular, um, there were a whole series of kind of commissions in the Democratic Party attempting to move it to the right. And the DLC uh, was formed in the, in the 80s. Um, really kind of oriented on a, a generation of kind of conservative Southern Democratic governors, um, Bill Clinton, of course, being uh, the, the most important. And he would go on to be chair or president of the DLC in the early 90s, shortly before being elected president. And and for, for Clinton, the, the kind of key policy is probably welfare reform, right? Um, so before Clinton, welfare was... Um, uh, a categorical grant program, which meant the federal government gave money to the states and said, You're gonna, this is how you have to spend it, right? You have to spend it on uh, money for, uh, on, on, on welfare expenditure, right? Clinton's uh, welfare bill in 1996 changed welfare to a block grant, which meant that the Gover- the federal government is now giving money to the states for purposes of poverty reduction, but is saying, you know, you have wide latitude over how to spend it. So actually huge amounts of what welfare spending now is spent on things like conservative marriage promotion policies, you know, things like that, right? Um, because the states say, oh, well, if we can get people to get married, you know, that'll reduce poverty. And so they're allowed, you know, they're not just giving money to poor people anymore. They're spending it on these kind of boondoggle programs um, and punitive workfare measures, things like that. And all of this was in the name of like modernizing, right? We need like the old welfare system is uh, attached to a kind of a, an old economy that doesn't exist anymore. For the new economy, we need this new lean, innovative welfare system, right? That that was the ideology of the third way in the United States. Um, in the UK, I think uh, the Iraq War is kind of the key and uh, the key moment of of um, Tony Blair's uh, uh, premiership. And and in the UK, it, it's important to see that in the context of like the Labour Party's evolution. So, in the early 1980s, the Labour Party's leadership was for unilateral nuclear uh, denuclearization, which were leaving NATO, right? Like a very left wing uh, foreign policy, which, by the way, was not like at all uh, unusual among kind of left of center parties outside of the United States. Like even the Liberal Party in Canada that uh, Trudeau is now part of was very suspicious of NATO. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, but, but this kind of, this political heritage in the Labour Party uh, was totally jettisoned by Blair, who over the course of his premiership uh, attached, uh, sought to attach the British state kind of more and more firmly uh, to the United States and this Atlanticist partnership um, which, you know, started in, in the wars in, 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 in Yugoslavia, um, in particular with collaboration in the wars in Yugoslavia. And then uh, when the Blair government emerged as the most important junior partner to the United States invasion of Iraq in 2003, um, it was an attempt to both kind of reassert Britain's um, uh, 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 imperial role in the world, right? Ever since the British Empire had, you know, decisively fallen apart in the 1960s, there'd been this kind of post-imperial malaise in the UK, and and this kind of new muscular internationalism was an attempt to to beat that back, um, and uh, uh, an assertion that like that Britain was not going to be um, an enemy, <laughs> right, or a rival of the of, of the U.S. on the world stage, but was going to be uh, totally linked to the United States' broader global political project of, you know, a certain vision of capitalist globalization and, and all of that. So you bring this into conversation with, and and some of this will be new to people, some of this probably, I mean, certainly the general are, are outlines of this aren't, just the idea, if you wanted to really simplify it, of social democratic parties moving to the right. But it wasn't as simple as that mm-hmm. because there was this... For, you know, first of all, what's the relationship between the genuine ideological convictions of obviously right wing politicians in an objective sense like Tony Blair, or Bill Clinton, um, sort mm-hmm. of marketeer politicians versus other uh, politicians caught in this who may have not had the same may have been more along the lines of, well, we don't really want to do this, but this is the only thing that's possible in the 80s and 90s, mm-hmm. which is a much more justifiable view than some people might realize, not that we would agree with it. Uh, Mm -hmm. and then this, but then this idea, and you, you mentioned Thomas Friedman and as embarrassing it is, he, as it is, he would be the patron saint of these people. 
the mm-hmm. emphasis on innovation, on being with what's new and on radical change and this and, and all of this type of thing. And in a weird way, and you make this connection, that is sort of oddly the most Marxist part of it in a very bastardized and dumbed down sense. And we can go this into, you know, the management training mm-hmm. manuals of this time where, you know, like mm-hmm. some, some, you know, some silly management guru who's, you know, advising companies on da- downsizing or, you know, tacky branding campaigns. You know, if you look at those books from like the late nineties, early aughts, like definitely let's, you know, let's, let's throw in a Mao quote, you know, that'll really show yeah. like where we're at. <laughs> and, and so, and certainly in the UK where there was more of an actual left, some of the most kind of ardent Blairites had had, you know, Trotskyite roots in the eighties. Mm-hmm. And they sort of brought along with them this certain understanding, which you do, you know, you say is found in Marx and then Lenin of, of that Marxism is about a future, no nostalgia for the past, no ideas, mm-hmm. you know, taken from pre-modernity. It's about, you know, hyper modernization, but for justice instead of for capitalism. So is there a through line there um, in terms of a certain way of looking at Marxism and how third way discourse developed? Oh, yeah, I, I definitely think so. And like you say, I think it, it's particularly strong in the case of the UK, where in the 1980s, the magazine Marxism Today, which was associated with the Communist Party, was one of the kind of leading apostles of new times, right, that capitalism was changing, and that the old politics of labor weren't going to be sufficient. Um, and, and people from that milieu definitely ended up around, uh, around Blairism. Um, And yeah, you know, you read some of this stuff and it sounds like the first dozen or so pages of the Communist Manifesto, all that is solid melts into air, right? All that is holy is profane. Um, uh, All the traditional relationships between people are upended. Um, You know, yeah, you read these kind of like, you read Thomas Friedman, it sounds kind of like that. Um, And so uh, there there was a sense in which um, they were able to draw on what I think had historically been one of the the strengths of the left, right? The left, the the historic kind of appeal of the left was, um, you know, the bourgeoisie led its revolution, and uh, and they gave us capitalism, and now it's time for the workers to lead our revolution. We're going to have socialism, right? We're the we're the next step in history, and of course. The, the course of the 20th century um, <laughs> leave a lot of confidence in that in that particular vision of history of, of socialism is kind of the logical next step. Um, and in some ways, I think the third way was uh, was cashing in on that lack of confidence of the left, um, you know, in the 1980s and, and 1990s in particular. Um, but uh, at the same time, as I say in the piece, when you kind of really dig into their vision of ceaseless change, it ends up being a vision in which nothing is really ever going to change, right? So this is when Francis Fukuyama writes The End of History, right? An essay about how a liberal capitalist democracy is the kind of uh, final resting place of history, right? Like this is the final form of human society. Um, and so it was, it was, the idea was kind of like there, there's a world of ceaseless change, but in which nothing fundamental is going to change, right? All the change is ultimately surface level. It's everyone getting cell phones, right? Everyone getting cell phones, massive world historical change. But the, also the social relations that make up our society, the forms of hierarchy, the way we organize our society, all of that is going to stay the same forever now, right? And I think that was ultimately a real, a real weakness uh, of the third way and, and one, one reason for its failure. And so explain that failure and then the kind of way in which ironically socialism reemerges and even just as personified by a Bernie Sanders, right, is yeah. some <laughs> sense of like, no, actually, maybe and maybe even, you know, and this is maybe where Marx and Lenin were missing the point, too. We actually do need to mm-hmm. retrieve something um, that's older, and 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 mm-hmm. and and has been like a lost tradition that's worth rediscovering. Put those two things into relationship. Yeah, I, I just love the kind of befuddlement with which the pundits like treat the appeal of Bernie to young, you know, to young voters, voters under thirty-five or so. They just can't wrap their heads around it. It drives them crazy. Why are they voting for this guy in his late seventies? It doesn't make any sense. Um, but you know, when you when you see what Bernie's saying, it it actually makes perfect sense. And it, and Bernie's appeal flows, I think, directly from the the foundering of the Third Way. Um, so yeah, and if you you know if you look at the nineteen nineties, if you look in the late nineteen nineties. Um, 
the the third way seems like a, a juggernaut, right? Like Tony Blair is uh, is the uh, prime minister uh, of the UK and is moving forward with all kinds of plans. Clinton is in the U.S. with very high approval ratings, has you know pushed through welfare reform. The economy is booming. Um, it really seems like uh, the, the third way prescription was was right that these politics are kind of in sync with the times. Um, but over the next decade and a half or so, things change, and in the UK, it's really the Iraq War that undoes the project. Um, it unleashes just such a massive scale of opposition inside the UK um, that it, it completely shatters the, the, the Blairite political project um, so that, you know, the, the, the Labour Party's uh, popularity is driven way down. Um, and while Blair and then his successor, Gordon Brown, are able to kind of limp through until 2010, what's really notable is that since then, the Blairites have really been unable to constitute a kind of coherent hegemonic force in the Labour Party. You know, you had Ed Miliband as a leader who was a representative of the soft left, not the Blairite tradition, right? Um, the Blairite tradition is, is further to the right. And, and you know, just, just I think in the last week or so, Jess Phillips, who is kind of the the uh, most prominent defender of, of that tradition in the party today announced she was stepping down from from uh, contending for leadership. So there's been a real exhaustion um, and, and in, the, sir, in the Labour and, Party. And, yeah, and just and Rebecca Long Bailey obviously is the person in our corner um, in terms of kind mm -hmm. of continuing the defense of of really trying to fight for a, a socialist position. But uh, Starmer, Keir, Keir Starmer, who's the sort of you know, the the candidate of the center, it, I mean, he's he's making, I mean, he's Blairiting the Blairites. He's coming out and he's saying, you know, we need a party that embraces Jeremy Corbyn and Tony Blair, which is, of course, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, you know, it's questionable, but it's certainly a rebuke to Blair because Blair's out saying we need yeah. to uproot everything to do with Corbyn root and branch. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's uh, they're they're just completely unable to kind of seize the high ground in the debates. Right. Um, and you know, I'm sure they'll end up backing Starmer, but he is not of them, right? In the sense that right. uh, that, that Phillips was. Right. Um, so so in the UK, the the, the Iraq War is, is really what what kind of leads to the 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 end of uh, of the third wave as a hegemonic force in the Labour Party. In the United States, it's not nearly so dramatic, partially because the Iraq War is carried out by the Republicans, right? I mean, if the disaster of the Iraq War had been on the Democrats' neck, it's very possible it would have come earlier in the United States, but it wasn't. It was on Bush. And so the Democrats were able to come in in 2006 in the congressional elections, and then in 2008, the presidential elections, as the party of the, the rebuke of the Iraq War. And then, you know, in particular, they got lucky with the timing in 2008 where they were able to come in as the party that's going to clean up the financial crisis. And yet it was that very, the very way that cleaning up was conducted that I think led to the, the, the kind of slow disillusionment. And, and, and I, I think it is fair to call Obama a, a politician of the third way in this sense, right? Um, I think that, uh, you know, even as he was running against Hillary Clinton in 2008, um, he, the fact that the leadership contest in 2008 was between Clinton and Obama is really a testament to just how thoroughly uh, uh, Bill Clinton's kind of DLC vision of the party had won, right? Um, that, that, that the entire debate was between two politicians who hewed very, very closely to the third way line. Um, and so as the, you know, the recovery kind of proceeded, and we just had this incredibly unequal recovery, you know, the, the, the scale of, of losses to homeowners, the number of people, you know, number of people who lost their homes, um, and the kind of slow ticking up of deaths of despair, right? Um, all of this, I think, was uh, um, slowly hollowing out the edifice. Of, uh, of third wave politics inside the Democratic Party. And so, you know, you had the slow collapse of the Democratic Party in so many states under Obama, right? The, the, the persistent loss of the party on the state level. Um, and, and, and all of this meant that when 2016 came around, um, the, the party as an institution was totally blindsided by Trump and, and unable to respond in any kind of effective way, right? And, and then Sanders' run exposed just how big of an audience there was inside the Democratic Party for a fundamentally different political uh, 
uh, um, position, for a different political orientation. And so, so these kind of, so you know, in the UK, um, the Iraq War is this kind of detonation of, of Blairism. Um, in the US, the Obama presidency was kind of a slow hollowing out of third wave politics that I think, you know, to this day, we're seeing um, very little capacity for, uh, for third way type uh, politicians to organize on their own terms. They're actually being forced to tail Sanders at this point. Right. And as you point out, I mean, whether or not I, I understand the more kind of precision way of defining third way, but I do think there's, you know, there is a much more elastic way of defining it as this sort of like, I mean, frankly, especially at this point, as it's really come to a complete intellectual standstill as just sort of, you know, socially moderate market politics, essentially. Right. And that's why you said, yeah. I mean, Biden is the carrier of that tradition right now. And, He's running basically entirely on, you know, things were, you know, better under Obama. Let's just get to that. So in contrast to, mm -hmm. you know, if you ask me what my agenda is, it's change, change, change. It's, you know, it's just, you know, you ask me what my agenda is, it's, you know, Obama, not Trump, Obama, not Trump. Um, there isn't mm -hmm. this new like and, and you know, it's it's actually funny because you. You know, I don't want to say he's like Don Quixote because Tony Blair is, you know, making an obscene amount of money in private equity <laughs> and advising dictatorships. Right. And, you know, there, actually, I just saw a new project. He's going to be he's going to be the I believe it's the Saudis or the Emirates, the head of uh, SoftBank, the guy who helped propel rework and Tony Blair mm -hmm. have been contracted by the Indonesian government to help them design their new capital. That was the dystopian story of the week. So oh, all that being said, Tony Blair, but Tony Blair, when he intervenes in British politics, there is this very Don Quixote feeling about him because he still has the, you know, he mm -hmm. obviously looks a lot more tired and everything, but he still has the presentation. He still has the style. He still has the, the communicative capacity and he's just saying exactly, I mean, and, and, you know, now he's reacting against Corbyn, but, his basic, mm -hmm. you know, we need to be innovative. We need to be change oriented. And mm -hmm. you're like, whoa, whoa, what? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't even know what you're talking about, <laughs> right? Like, you know, we all at least knew generally what this meant in the 90s. And now it's just, you know, purely at the level of cliche. That being said, mm -hmm. before we wrap it up, I mean, Corbyn is this dent in the narrative. And I think, we, of course, we have to acknowledge Brexit. We have to acknowledge an unprecedented and vicious propaganda campaign against him, which I have no doubt would also, if we really got into it, implicate different intelligence services. And I mean, and, right. and, and has a lot of stories to say about media monopolies. And by the way, these raw material things are also something that we in the left have to consider. There is an enormous amount of obviously power, wealth, and ideological uh, hegemony amongst the ruling classes globally. So these are big challenges. I mean, some, that's, that's probably mm -hmm. the main story about Corbyn, but it's still whether, you know, even with all of those caveats, it's a failure of our model. So what's the, how does this affect our narrative about this sort of resurgence of socialism, especially when somebody with such clarity and integrity could be torn apart by, you know, a buffoon like Boris Johnson? Yeah, I mean, I think it means that their fall isn't necessarily our rise, right? You know, um, that the, the the end of the third way doesn't mean an automatic victory for socialism. It might, you know, it might mean like muddling around until some new Tony Blair comes around with a couple different uh, buzzwords that'll sound new for a while. You know, um, there's yep. not there's nothing inevitable about about socialist rise, and and we should never mistake the weakness of our enemies for our strength. And I think the, the Corbin uh, loss was, you know, a devastating reminder of that. Um, and I think it, you know, it, it, I think it's also a testament to uh, the way that, that uh, third way politics in, in, in particular hollowed out the, the labor party, yeah. you know, that the labor party as an institution um, had become totally disconnected from traditional labor voters in huge parts of the country. And the Corbyn was able to bring, you know, an influx in particular of like urban youth, 
basically, you know, often, often educated urban youth into the party who came in in massive numbers, but were unable to make up for that hollowing out. Um, right. And in that sense, and I think that's that's something that we're probably going to face in the Democratic Party too. You know, um, if if, uh, if Bernie manages to to win the primaries, the, all of a sudden the weakness of the Democrats in many states suddenly becomes a, like a, one of the less number one problems. You know, that suddenly becomes our problem that but, we have to fix. And face maybe conversely, <laughs> another reason why I mean, it's not going to make up for organization. But thank you, Hillary Clinton. Because, I mean, yeah. you know, in a general election, to have the Democratic standard bearer be someone Hillary Clinton hates will be incredibly helpful in pivotal, pivotal yeah. places that yeah. need to mobilize people. That will be a, a you, big you trust builder for him in a place like Wisconsin. Yeah. You, you wonder if her and Blair are like comparing notes behind the scenes of like, yeah. well, I think this is going to be really successful. So I'm going to go say, like, you know, they managed to both hit the wrong notes just so persistently that um, it's a pretty impressive level of coordination. And you say, just as a final note, you say um, old fashioned socialism, it turns out is the good old thing best suited for combating the bad new things of modern capitalism. So make that case uh, in the last minute here. Yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're seeing a world in which the problems of modern capitalism have been, have been dramatized as never before. And I think also in the United States right now, we saw, we saw this before but to an extent, but I think we're seeing it even more right now. The, the power of a basic socialist vision of the working class needs to stand together against the people at the top of society. Um, you know, every day just reading about Sanders, listening to podcasts about Sanders supporters, things like that, you're seeing the way that that very basic old socialist vision can animate people and provide a sense of purpose that is really lacking elsewhere in politics right now. And I think that's a very powerful thing and a very exciting thing. Paul Heidman, The Peace is the Third Way is the Past, Socialism is the Future. Read it in Jacobin, link on the show website. Paul, really appreciate your time. Hey, thanks so much for having me, Michael. Thank you. All right, folks, um, let me just say this first. Today's show is brought to you in part by Hunt a Killer, an activity that allows you to work as a team and investigate crime in the comfort of your home. It's the badass murder. It's the badass murder investigation where you decode ciphers, examine clues, and solve puzzles. Go to huntakiller.com slash majority. Use promo code majority at the checkout for 20% off your first box. That's huntakiller.com slash majority. Promo code majority. Become a member of the Majority Report today, majority.fm slash become a member. That's how this whole thing happens. If you haven't already, click subscribe and the bell button on YouTube and check out justcoffee.co, uh, what is it? Justcoffee.coop, sorry. Fair trade, tea, coffee, or chocolate, buy yourself the Majority Report blend. It's a win for everyone. Workers, ecology, the co-op economy, the Majority Report, independent, unbought, unbossed media go over to the michael brooks show youtube page incredibly proud that the first half of our interview with former president lula da silva is up former brazilian president political prisoner uh some great new information on negotiations with iran uh, but a crash course in southern solidarity u.s imperialism it's you know obviously i'm really proud of it if you haven't yet go over there and watch it and while you're over there click subscribe and the bell button on the michael brooks show on youtube we're at well over a hundred thousand subs now and continue to grow we're very excited about it and we're excited to see you at the bell house february 7th with alona minkowski matt binder brandon sutton harvey k and ben burgess it's going to be really, really fun. Go buy your tickets, and you can get all information for all things TMBS at tmbs.fm. And, of course, the best thing to do, and other, uh, you will find out you get early ticket sales. April 3rd, we're doing a live show in Austin, Texas with Anna Kasparian, and Patreon members got the early bird discount. So patreon.com slash TMBS. See you soon. Matt. Uh, yeah, folks, check out the Literary Hangover YouTube page as well. Uh, there, right now, it's basically the uh, waveform of the podcast, so it's a, another way to listen to the podcast, but uh, going to be expanding into some historical documentary uh, uh, stuff with my partner, Alex, so uh, you want to get on the ground floor of that, so go over and subscribe to Literary Hangover YouTube channel. Sweet. See you guys in the fun half. 
left it best. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> That's a good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, uh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight. 56, 27, one half, five eighths, 3.9 billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd, don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of spewing vitriol and hatred, you left wing Limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Grand Paul. I had my first post coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. What you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agreed. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> Ooh. Wow. Um, but Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. Please. Welcome. Welcome to the fun half. Michael Brooks here. I uh, hope everybody is doing well. I think we're on the phones. Let me try to take a phone call out of the gate. You're calling from a 605 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? 605, are you there? This is me? Uh, yeah. What's yeah, your name? Where uh, are you Malik calling from? Malik in Minnesota. Oh, hey, Malik. How's it going? What's on your mind? Swell. Um, uh, I wanted to bring up something that you had said yesterday, because I've actually made the argument, and I want to hear um, you talk a little bit more about it, which was the, the idea that uh, if wealthy people are racist, that... Um, Um, I forget exactly Hello? what you said, but it was like, like uh, wealthy people being racist is uh, disproves that economic anxiety drove Trump support, something along those lines. No, that and I was wasn't just curious exactly about it what I, I, I support. Yeah, that wasn't yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly I support what I said. And I just wanted to hear what your thoughts were. You want to debunk me on that argument? He wants to debunk no, you I don't of want that argument. You. <laughs> when oh. people say to debunk myself. <laughs> when oh. people say rich people are uh, racist and vote Republican, uh, that debunks the economic anxiety. Oh, argument. okay, I got you. All right, I understand. And actually, it's funny. I didn't pull it, but somebody just sent me some uh, research, which I, uh, you know, I, I uh, maybe I should have printed it. But basically, the fa there was a. Um, a lot of research indicating, which, and again, this shouldn't be a surprise to anybody, that that um, when in times of economic hardship, that uh, fear perception across race lines increases. So I, I think they're both true things. But let me get to what you're what you're saying. 
it, the argument that people make rests on an incredibly simplistic and reductive reading of both sides of the argument, which again, I, I don't really fundamentally think are in conflict, but let, I'll just play along, which is that so-called economic anxiety is the only sort of driver of, of racism, right? And then on the other hand, this idea that um, racism is some type of like moral metaphysical force that exists outside of time and history and, you know, just white people just have it as like this disease and it, you know, it can't be dealt with really other than maybe through like kind of symbolic acts. Um, now, what I think... And so people use this argument. They'll say, well, there's, you know, look at the base of the Republican Party. There's a ton of wealthy white people, and they're obviously voting for um, and supporting and at the bare minimum comfortable with racism, right? Or else there's no way you could be, uh, I forget, just supporting Trump. I mean, there's no way you could be supporting avidly Mitt Romney and be aware of all the issues and not have a lot of comfort with a fair amount of racism. Mitt Romney talked about self-deporting. And the point is um, that... You know, and again, some of it requires a little bit more reading and thinking, and it, it can't just be reduced to a poll number. But it's the idea that if you're in a position of wealth and a position of status, you will very much want to reinforce narratives and storylines that justify the world as it is. Reinforce and hierarchy. Reinforce hierarchy. Racism is the main, if not one of the main <laughs> hierarchies and storylines of the United States. And so the, then they'll manifest differently. So as an example, when you're going, uh, you know, when you're at some rally and you're doing Trumpian racism, you'll rant about jobs and do a bunch of, you know, the Breitbart, um, you know, borderline Hitlerian, in my opinion, coverage of, of the border and all of the exaggerations and lies about crime, right? But then if you're um, on the other side of the income ladder and another different status, you're gonna sit back and crack open the bell curve and go, whoa. Not just, by the way, if you read the whole bell curve, it's, it's def I would say it's an objectively racist book, but it's a fundamentally a class justification and stratification book. Oh, we live in a knowledge economy and there's increased inequality. Oh, that's a bummer. Oh, nothing can be done about it because these people have bad brains genetically. That's interesting. See, those are different. Those are, they share racism and class, but they're very different types of narratives and they play on very different types of manifestations of the same thing, but they both have material correlates. And again, we don't need to be, you know, Let's be obvious about it, right? Like one is the classic racist line of dividing up the electorate and using um, racism and fear to divide people when they have some overlapping class interests. That does exist as much as, you know, so there, it's apparently some people want to deny that. That's a real thing. And then when you go to the wealthy end, it's... Um, you know, it, there's no mistake that Charles Murray, one of his recent books is all about the new, the white underclass. And the problem is, is that they're so, so socially pathological, right? And because he can't do the genetic stuff in the same way because, you know, but it's now it's all just a culture answer. And that's another big concern I have with some of the direction that I see some of the quote unquote woke discourse going is I see it really becoming See, just a bunch of culture my, answers to economic problems. But that's how I would say my, they're my, interplay. My, and, and, but I just, so I, Malik, go I, I for, appreciate just, all that. Can my, I just say really quick concern, before, hold on, just, just, concern, one, just like, one sec, just one sec. It's a, it's there's that, no, just there's one like sec. A pivot. Malik, hold on, just one sec. There's a pivot Malik, to the economics. Malik, hold on, okay. just, I'm going to mute you, just one second. There's no, then go and take as much time as you need. But there is no version of what I just said that is rigorous and fair that denies the centrality of race and racism. It's a analysis of how and why these things are working that is more in relationship, you know, to politics. And again, I'm talking about politics. I'm not talking about various other manifestations of these things, which are huge problems and serious, but not necessarily the same as people's voting patterns, as an example. But anyways, Malik, go ahead, please. No, I, I'm talking in terms of politics, too. So I, okay. I agree with most, if not all of that. Right. My concern 
um, going all the way back to 2016 is that a lot of Bernie like supporters and Bernie um, surrogate types will often when we're when faced with a, a question about inequalities, particularly racial inequalities, will pivot to, well, that's why we need you know X economic program. And the the person on the receiving end of that argument, right? that that doesn't actually address their concern and he already does have a good civil rights record and so i just think like pointing to the civil rights record pointing to specific like policies like i'm going to appoint an attorney general who will you know bring back the consent degrees from the obama era right yep. those things is, are a way better answer to that than to say well, universal health care and a jobs program and eliminating debt, though it doesn't address the problem. Can I so just that's say, all I'm saying. Well, let me like, just say this to you. Ahead. Let me just say this. Top line, I agree with you, right? Like, there's no doubt, particularly with the issues that you just were raising, like, you need to be saying, I'm going to have a strategy to fight the courts on civil rights suppression and voter suppression, which Republicans and the Supreme Court have been assaulting for you know uh, decades and and very much in the last decade, like, and we're going to bring back the consent degree and all. I a hundred percent agree with you, right? Where I want to make it a little bit more complicated, though, is just one. There is an objective difference in this cycle versus 2016. So I think sometimes. The reason that, you know, Bernie folks get reactive is because like in 2016, and I could even include myself in this, but I wouldn't, but I would just say a lot of people, including people who were ardent Bernie supporters, such as myself, would sometimes level critiques like that. In 2019, most critiques you hear like this in media are uniformly dishonest and bad faith and from people that hate him. And... The third thing I would say that really does need to be brought into the mix here, and and it's a delicate balance, but it needs to be brought into the mix. A thousand percent, if somebody asked Bernie or a surrogate, what are you going to do about voter suppression? What are you going to do about reversal of civil rights? And if they immediately start, or he immediately starts talking about Medicare, that is a mistake in that context. I agree with you. And I think there's been improvement on that. More, yeah, I, but, I totally but, agree but, on the improvement. I just, but let me just I say, lot, me, like I've Malik, a lot of people let me, on the ground, Malik, so listeners, Malik, let me they just, should talk about that. Sorry, say that in a second. Let me just add this third thing because I think it's I think it's interesting. On the other hand, and or not even on the other hand, that has to be synthesized. I have seen again a countervailing argument, which is actually to start to say that issues like housing and healthcare are not issues that, of course, first of all, yes, they do apply to everybody and particularly poor people across the board. And that is ultimately how you're going to build a coalition and it is ultimately how you're going to deliver these things. But those are apps like Adolf Reed calculated in 2016, and I'm sure it would apply today, that if you just pass the Bernie Sanders agenda on Medicare for all and a couple of other key issues, it would represent the largest wealth redistribution and resource redistribution along racial lines, I believe since reconstruction. So when you start having people say that that stuff doesn't overlap or that doesn't speak to people's issues, you are being really dishonest and you're erasing a lot of really important reality. And I would say sometimes when I look at this along class lines, when I talk to people of color from lower and working class backgrounds, they don't have absolutely I've heard the same critique you've leveled, which we both agree on that you need to talk specifically about uh, civil rights and voting rights and so on, no doubt. But there's a immediate and attracts all the polling like, yes, of course, when you're talking about <laughs> Healthcare disparities, of course, that's a racial issue. And of course, that's an injustice issue. Now, when I talk to friends of mine of color from upper class backgrounds, like other upper class people, uh, they're less preoccupied with the economics. So I think the other thing that starts to come in here is that we are literally taught, you're also just talking about different ways of slicing up and understanding the electorate. And I think, by the way, that's a mistake that people on both sides make, because sometimes when Bernie immediately pivots to poverty and injustice issues, that misses that there's a large middle and upper class. I mean, it's been under assault in this country and not allowed to form and so on, but there are plenty of people of color 
who are affluent in the middle of class and they might have a, and do have a different issue set. And, you know, that also is something we have to track. So big picture, Malik, I agree with you. I just think particularly in media, we need to be really smart about how we pull off these conversations because there's a lot of different things flying. And right now, unfortunately, a lot of bad faith attacks. Yeah, I appreciate it. And I, and I, I just, I'm thinking too of like the people who are going to be knocking doors and, and phone calling, like those are the ones where, um, there's, there, there just seems to be a, a, a constant pivot to that. And if that's not the, the topic, like if we're talking about specific race issues or, um, you know, how Trump got elected or whatever, then going to the economics, it, I think it just turns people away, um, because they're not, that's not what they were talking about. And so, um, so yeah, but by and large, I agree. Um, so I appreciate it and I do feel like I have a better grasp well, I hope so. what you were saying. I hope so. so. I hope, I hope Bye. I put it across. Well, I appreciate the call. Thanks for hanging in there with me. Thanks. Um, and I took more time on that one because I hopefully will not have to keep revisiting this. <laughs> but probably not. Uh, Let's see, you're calling from a 97, let me scroll up, 972 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? 972, are you there? Going, you hello? What's up? Sorry, what's up? Hey, what's up? What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hello? Uh, my name is Alex. I'm calling from Dallas, Texas. Hey, Alex, what's up? So uh, I have a like, two-part thing question. So... Um, I phone banked uh, quite a bit. I think I've done it like four times for Bernie in Iowa awesome. and in Nevada. Um, and for the most part, I think I'm getting mostly Bernie supporters. And for the people who are leaning towards Biden, the number one argument or the number one reason they have is like, oh, I support Medicare for all. I think that's really good for my family, but I just don't think it's going to be passed or something along the lines or he doesn't have any Senate support or anything to get anything done. Right. And I think the the like the narrative that Clinton felt about nobody likes him in the Senate is like um you know, that like kind of feeds into that, oh, you know, yeah. he can't caucus. Uh -huh. So I was like I you know, I just called him to ask like what do I how do I respond to that or like what, what do I say? Well, I mean you could definitely say and I don't have it uh in front of me, but you know, the the reputation that Bernie has of not being an effective legislator is definitely very dishonest and grossly exaggerated. And, they're, you know, he's the amendment king and he's gotten plenty of things passed and he was a very active and serious legislator. And there's actually a clip. I forget his name, but there's a former Republican congressman in 2016 Bob Nay basically saying like Bernie was amazing. And in fact, Bernie would even insist on having other like Bernie would. There's pieces right. of legislation Bernie's not getting credit for because his name isn't on it because he didn't care about pride of place because he just wanted to get something done. So I think you can, you know, have a couple. I think it would be good to probably talk about what he's done on Veterans Affairs and things like that. Right. The second thing to say is to just be like, yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's a funny. What did you say? It was the height of neoliberalism. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know if you could, I don't know if that's, you know. Maybe wanna, not to a Yeah, I want to simplify it for yeah. a call, but I mean, it's kind of like, you know, this guy was pushing against the tide for 40 years, you know? I mean, for look, if, years, if yeah. you want he somebody. He worked with, like, Republicans. He worked I mean, he with everybody. With got, Grand Paul. Yeah. He worked yeah. with everybody, got a lot done. You should definitely, I would put that as the biggest emphasis, but the smaller emphasis, yeah. if, if people still have questions, just be like, Look, this guy was, you know, his time had not come yet. So if you want a bunch of, you know, when every time they make that quote, it's like, yeah, Bernie did not partner with you to, um, you know, shovel money to defense contractors to expand the death penalty to, you know, pass trade deals that lose people jobs to try to partner right. up to cut Social Security. Yeah, he wasn't doing all of that. He was saying everybody should have health care when... That was considered weird, you know? He was, I mean, yeah. the consequence for being right and, and holding values is that sometimes you're marginalized. And so, you know. So yeah. the, what, the main thing I go with, um, and this is, I think, the most important thing is that president is like awfully, like largely, not only like as a legislative role, is like a, a symbolic role, right? He holds rallies. And so, you yeah. know, the, I think the number one thing he says is he's an organizer in chief, right? You go 
to the states where you have dissenting like congressmen and you rally up the working class in that area right. to pressure them to vote for and i think that's the most effective thing you can do is like you know once you have like grassroots support that like pressures the hell out of these congressmen to like vote in line with like the agenda of the people um then there's like you know there's no there's no choice in that aspect um right I, I think that's right. I, but I would look I would look up some examples of his legislating because he actually really is very effective. And also, for what it's worth, I mean, it's yeah. it's old at this point. But I mean, the guy, he wouldn't yeah. be anywhere if he wasn't a successful mayor. And yeah. being a mayor exactly. really right. is. I, I hate these cliches in politics. But from what I understand, it seems to me that being a mayor probably is the most like you kind of do it or you don't job in politics, you know. Yeah. How people and, legislated and, and that that is very contextual. And even governor, you could say there's like different layers of bureaucracy and different governors have different types of power. But if you're an actual mayor, not a ceremonial one that runs a city, there's a lot of bucks that genuinely stop with you. Um, you know, from a yeah. municipal standpoint, municipal standpoint. And, and he as did a very a good mayor, job. Like he single handedly or not single handedly, but like with this coalition, like he like he completely like eradicated, like he purged like the city of like the, 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 you know, the bourgeoisie, like the, the whole, like, uh, let me, let me just like real quick. Culture. I would not use those terms. Oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use them. I, <laughs> I would not say that, a purge like, of the bourgeoisie. No. <laughs> 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 this is a safe space. I can say that. Yes, though. that's true. You can say uh, it here. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, brother. Yeah. But yeah. Um, all right, man. Thanks for doing Thank what you, you do. So this show is amazing. Oh, appreciate it. Man. Uh, all right, man. Here's what uh, I don't know if you can necessarily say this is getting something done, uh, but I would say in terms of what needed to be doing uh, back at this time, this is what I would want here. And I think we've already taken some steps in this committee John to trim back uh, some subsidies that we think are not justified. And uh, I'm, I also want you to know that I got this morning two copies of the Cato study that I intend to review uh, over the weekend, and uh, we're going to look at it carefully. Would there be a possibility? Again, the only point, I don't want to beat a dead horse here. You have made some cuts which are going to hurt a whole lot of people. There's no debate about that, correct? And obviously, you made those cuts because you think in the long-term best interest of America, we have to save that money. Now, you and I have a disagreement about priorities. I respect your sincerity in that. That's it. I mean, and by the way, that, and that basically is Bernie for decades yeah, with Republicans evergreen. and Democrats. So the reason he didn't, quote, get stuff done is because he didn't partner with John Kasich on the budget stability and make seniors homeless act of 1998. You know, I mean, like that, all of those arguments are just they're they're just breathtakingly stupid and ahistorical. They don't mean anything. Thank God Bernie never got anything quote unquote done like that. Yeah. Because anybody who was, it was bad for most people. Yeah, these are Twitch streamer arguments. Yes. Um let's do uh oh my god. Here is another guy. Jim Messina. Can you look up for me? Can we do a little real time research here? Can you put up Jim Messina? Max Baucus barbershop ad. Just tickle me with a feather. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? Just, you know, just, 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 just give me a little research here. Let's see if we can find that. It should be 2002. Notorious hairdresser ad. This became a thing in 2012. All right, so Jim Messina... His main claim to fame is he was Obama's reelect uh, captain for 2012. And there's a couple of interesting things about that. One, because reelecting an incumbent president is the accomplishment of the his The video's career. been taken down. The so. video, oh, that's interesting. You know what? Let me then read a little description of this ad. And I think it's in the first intercept piece that comes up in the search. So he, but before he worked, so... Number one, of course, any presidential campaign is a challenge. You have to have some, you know, and you're going up against the Republicans and all their money and everything else. But he didn't get Obama elected in 2008. In other words, there's people I don't, you know, he wasn't a main factor in that. I think he was in the campaign, but he was not the campaign manager. So I'm not a big fan of David Plouffe or David Axelrod, but you would have to say 
these guys at least, you know, they did something. They made history. They helped elect the first African-American president. This guy got him reelected. And a big reason that Obama ended up getting pretty comfortably reelected was because in contrast to his, you know, extremely centrist and bank friendly policies, he beat the shit out of Mitt Romney for being a private equity vulture. Those ads were devastating and effective. And they were also set up originally by Newt Gingrich, which is kind of funny, another sort of interesting side piece to the 2012. So Jim Messina, who after a couple of decades spent working for Max Baucus, who was one of the most corporate industry, just an industry bagman in the Senate. He would go on to become Obama's ambassador to China. I think he's a lobbyist now. Do we have a inter, do we have that? Could you just it's if you do the Google search, it's up there. It's in the intercept piece. Yeah, how an Obama crony moved from Idaho to a two million dollar Washington estate by Ken Silverstein, 2014. And this is a profile of Jim Messina. Now, let's go to yeah, up until 2002, Messina was largely unknown. But that year, when managing uh, Bacchus's Senate re-election campaign, he released one of the more homophobic ads in modern political times. Maybe if you click on that, there's still a version of it. Actually, you see that? Let's see. Nope, <laughs> they really wiped this. Yeah, it's awful. It featured a footage from a 20-year-old TV ad for a hair salon run by Bacchus's opponent, Mike Taylor, who at the time was 20 points in the polls behind and had no chance of winning, who was seen massaging a man's face while wearing an open front shirt and thus was, and hence was obviously supposed to be gay. The ad was set to a porn soundtrack, uh, caused the ad set to a poor soundtrack caused Taylor to drop out of the race when he announced weeks later that he was resuming a limited campaign and said he was getting, uh, you know, slandered uh, out of Montana politics and obviously clearly speaks to the massive homophobia of the time that he would consider that to be uh, getting slandered out. But the point is there's a screenshot, there's a screenshot there. of this. And I remember watching this ad. I mean, there's a point where when he, you know, I don't know how to describe it, but the point is, is that even by 2002 standards, this was a <laughs> profoundly homophobic piece of advertising. And that's basically the only reason that anybody knew who Jim Messina was till 2012. And he was, you know, again, for this corporate bag man, Max Baucus. Then Messina turned his Obama reelect victory into his primary client became the UK Tory party. He went to work for the right wing Tories in the United Kingdom. And he is also supposedly the one who told David Cameron that a Brexit referendum would be just fine. So Jim Messina, the worst call, of Jim all time. The, which is arguably the worst call in modern politics. And now he has some sort of consulting firm. God knows what sort of vulture clients he has. And he's on Morning Joe because out of the kindness of his heart, and his real concern for Democratic Party politics, this guy thinks that Bernie Sanders might not be a good candidate to run against Donald Trump. Okay. Um, it's interesting. First of all, those 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 numbers against who beats Trump is exactly what you're focused on, because that's what you, you feel voters most care about right now. And those are the numbers that can be depended on. But what about youth voters? Can they be depended on not just to show their opinions, but to show up at the polls? It is the great question. When you start to look at modeling who's going to be the electorate in this primary, the question is who's going to actually turn out to vote in this election? I think those numbers Mika showed are absolutely stunning because over 50% mm -hmm. of voters under 30 favor a candidate over 70 years old. Mm -hmm. You add up Bernie, Elizabeth, and Biden, and they're over 50% among young candidates. It says that that electability matters. It says that issues matter. This has always been Bernie's uh, big calling card that he could get the youth out. You know, we just had the highest turnout in a midterm election in 100 years with young voters. The question is, are these folks coming in a very big way? And if they do, it'll change the electoral math. You know, what's interesting and understandable, I think, about those numbers among millennials is uh, the devotion to Bernie Sanders is clearly understandable, big, large part, I think, because of his consistency over the years on issues. They value consistency, makes him unlike other, in their minds, politicians. Yep. And don't underestimate the fact 
that Bernie, a lot of what he says, the message is basically, you can live your life for free. We'll have free college tuition. We'll have free this. We'll forgive your student debts. It's a powerful message. It is, but in the general election, it's a message that I think is going to get him killed. Yeah. I mean, I you know think he's the worst candidate in a general election for exactly that reason. You think Bernie's the worst candidate? Oh, I don't, I don't think there's a question about it. I think it's very clear to me that with these swing voters that I care about, the Trump-Obama voters in the Midwestern states, Bernie Sanders is not the candidate we need to beat Donald Trump in November. Okay, so let me just say this. Maybe Jim Messina's background for uh, some Trump voters might be appealing, and by which I mean the Max Baucus ad in, 20, uh, in 2002. Now, of course, let's just two points here. This flies in the face of all evidence that we have. Bernie Sanders is now leading uh, Donald Trump more than anybody else in the general election. Bernie Sanders is a nationally popular figure outside of these sociopath precincts. Even uh, Barnacle and the other guy seemed a little credulous at that claim. Secondly, um, to the extent Messina has had some success in the United States, it's by running a campaign that's obviously nothing compared to Bernie's vision, but at least had a little bit of economic populism. And let me just suggest, I'm going to just read from Messina's client list. He's worked for Theresa May and David Cameron in the United Kingdom. He worked for the PRI, Enrique Pena Nieto in Mexico. He worked for Argentina's Mauricio Macri, a right winger who just lost after devastating the Argentinian economy. And then also helped Spain's right-wing leader, Mariana Rojo, to a surprise re-election in 2016. This is a guy, most Democrats will at least, they do their sleazy stuff for corporate clients and at least try to do sort of democratic analysis, analogous parties overseas, which are not radical anyways. He's also had private sector clients, and this is where... I wonder what these people uh, wonder how these people reflect the interests of the Midwest. Uber, Airbnb, Google, Delta Airlines, Hutchinson, Wampo, and seventy others. I don't even know what Hutchinson's Wampo is. So let me just say that I don't think that in. <laughs> I don't think that we should, I'm, I'm looking up to see if I could find more of his clients. That's why I'm distracted. But I don't think for a second should we doubt that it's going to be hard. And by the way, and it will be hard for anybody to beat Trump because he's an incumbent president. And if Bernie Sanders is the nominee, you will have the advantage of unprecedented enthusiasm, organizing, movement, energy, and commitment. And you will also have... I think the oligarchs as a block in this country trying to destroy and snuff out that movement, and it's going to be a serious problem. But it is not because of whatever fantasy life, this overcompensated and at times massively embarrassingly unsuccessful right-leaning made an ad so disgusting in Bush-era America you can't even find it on the internet, Jim Messina has to say. <laughs> You know, we talk about one of the reasons that you know how disgusting Hillary Clinton is, is because how could you keep somebody like Mark Penn around for so long? Mark Penn, who's been advising Trump recently, by the way, just, you know, it's just some of these people just ooze. I mean, and Mark Penn, like, I mean, he almost just seems like a guy who just enjoys being disgusting. Messina is th this guy for Obama. You know, you look at even the pod save guys and all these people and, they, you know, they're wrong and they're annoying and all of this stuff. But a lot of them don't ooze the same kind of just pure cravenness of a Mark Penn. Jim Messina does, to say the least. So watch that video, hit Bernie with a donation. And it's going to be really hard because people like Jim Messina, who are, quote, Democrats, like I have no doubt that Jim Messina is going to be on the other side of that election if Bernie Sanders is the nominee in whatever way, shape, or form that actually manifests. Even if it is just, I'm doing boring commentary on television to try to damage his chances. You have Joe Lockhart doing balls and strikes, quote unquote, commentary on CNN. The guy co-founded, in addition to being Bill Clinton's press secretary, 
The guy co-founded Glover Park Group. That's, that is one of the biggest Democratic and now Republican merged firms in D.C. They have clients, including going back to 2012, they did the Pete Peterson Cat Food Commission slash Social Security stuff. They did a major AstroTurf campaign for that. They've represented Verizon. They've represented the Saudi royal family. You really think that these people, and I'm sorry, this is where we can just start reducing stuff to basic class and professional interest. They want Bernie Sanders to be president of the United States, let alone in some type of functional leadership role of the Democratic Party? Give me a break. It's a fantasy. They know if somebody like Joe Biden is president, the contracts are there. The so uh, Here's for Sam. The social prestige, all there. Bernie Sanders elected major detonation. Even his success to this this far has been a major problem. And I think um, Barack Obama has not disavowed Jim Messina after Brexit in embarrassment, but they're probably uh, talking together. This is a new scoop, scoop from Charles Gasparano. Scoop. Democratic Party sources have spoken with uh, at Barack Obama, say the former pres is growing increasingly anxious about Bernie Sanders' rise in the national polls. Is that Jim? just Jim Messina and staff? Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> where an avowed socialist would take the country. He's considering a public statement addressing it more now at Fox News. Yeah, as Perrine said, as shortly after this came out, that it's less a sign that Obama is seriously considering a public statement in the so much as a sign that various people are begging him to make one. Exactly. Apparatus. Exactly. Do you think Obama wants to make a public statement against Bernie? I forget who said this. It's so this is this is frustrating when I do this. I know, and I apologize. This is not an original thought. Somebody else said this, but like for the life of me, cannot remember who said this. That Obama does not want. I think it might have been Matt Chrisman. I can't. I. Ugh, it's a, everything's a fragment. Obama doesn't want to do something like that because Obama's popularity and mystique and power is still resting on the fact that he has never advocated for anything so clearly. So this kind of vague, broad sense of popularity is rooted in obviously enormous respect because of what he accomplished and a lot of personal affection that cuts across the board. And if he starts getting into it like that, it's not just that it risks some of his popularity, which might be the case, but it also risks the idea that he doesn't have this hidden power that he's choosing not to use. Yeah. Because what if he comes out and makes a statement that is so unequivocal and plenty of people still say, oh, well, of course we like President Obama, but no. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I, I, I could think of multiple people that I know personally that are much more you know, fans of Barack Obama than I am who really like the guy, they're voting for Bernie Sanders. And if and if Barack Obama puts out a tweet, they'll say, oh, that's our statement. Oh, uh, oh, that's too bad. Hey, when's the next Netflix show he's doing? I want to check it out. It won't have any effect. And, I, and of course, I do think for the Bernie movement, which represents a huge amount of the Democratic Party, another person coming out and trying to block the guy, that'll just mean another Donations. record, another record <laughs> fundraising day. Yeah, uh, Hillary I, had to like reverse herself a day later too and say, actually, you know, the important thing is defeating Donald Trump. I, I, I'm, I saw. I'm sorry, people didn't want my authentic views. Oh, yeah, God. Well, I, don't I want, thought I want everyone wanted to know what away. I think. Yeah, right. Please authentically um, leave. Authentically do a do a snap poll with just Lane Maxwell and Harvey Weinstein. I am shocked by how uh, well they scrubbed this video from the. Uh, yeah. That was, well, that was, I mean, again, that video was a problem, like pre-woke problem. Like that was, that is a homophobic ad. <laughs> that is not like a, hey, I think that might be homo, or I'm going to do a textual reading. That is like a George W. Bush campaigning to enshrine discrimination in the Constitution. Like, hey, man, it's kind of homophobic. Um, So, and again, as my, my my principle with all of these things, Jim Messina didn't say, I mean, maybe he did some type of mealy mouth bullshit, but he didn't say, man, I really learned a lot. You know, I was young, trying to prove myself. Sorry, that was disgusting. He scrubbed the internet and then went on to help make Brexit and austerity happen. Um, I don't think, yeah, I'll do the Klobuchar thing in a second. So I think, and I also think if I had to speculate, and this is, the most useless part of this business, but I just like, if I had to speculate, I think that 
between Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders, Hillary Clinton is not, she's going to spoil her ballot or write herself in and probably prefers Trump on a personal level because she clearly has more hatred of Bernie about I mean, how if And her how class interests it, are aligned with Trump. Right, but how wouldn't it be clear that she wouldn't endorse Bernie, right? Like... That she no no she'll say she endorses Bernie. What I'm saying is that uh, even though Obama is a right wing Democrat and represents something different ideologically entirely than Bernie, I would be more inclined to still think. And maybe I'm giving him too much credit. I, I don't think Barack Obama. I think when Barack Obama trashes Bernie Sanders, it is because he's a right wing Democrat and because he doesn't like Bernie. But I think it's also because he has a certain view of politics which I don't think is up to date right now. I think Hillary Clinton could see the, someone could say Hillary Clinton could hire the same person to have her do that had her do uh, seances with Eleanor Roosevelt. Look it up. And by the way, I don't mean that it's a diss, obviously I'm just saying, look it up. And somebody could say, Hey, I Hillary, I have a crystal ball. I know for a fact it is a certainty that Bernie Sanders is the person running against Donald Trump and he will win. I think she would have still made the same statement because she hates Bernie Sanders. I think if Obama saw the same, you know, the crystal ball, he'd be like, wow, really? Well, now I'm, you know, I'm concerned about how he's going to govern. But I don't think he would still go out of his way to F Bernie. And again, maybe that's just giving Obama too much credit. But I, I think we're talking about different propositions here. Although, you know, Jim Messina's in the air. Jim Messina's a scumbag. Anyways, you know what? Maybe all these people are right. Maybe we need to not take a risk. Maybe we need to get a good common sense Midwestern perspective on all of this. Somebody who, you know, is not afraid to eat an egg salad with a comb, throw a coffee cup at a staffer, and someone who tells America that, you know, expecting things like healthcare is mostly just goddamn irresponsible. And if you can make up for have, I mean, Bill Clinton and Barack Obama have both proven that you can make up for a very limited policy agenda with outsized personal charisma. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Amy Klobuchar, a montage of humor. He sent out a tweet. He made fun of me for talking about climate change in the middle of a blizzard, and he called me Snow Woman. So I wrote back, hey, Donald Trump, the science is on my side, and I'd like to see how your hair would fare in a blizzard. <laughs> So I wrote back, hey, Donald Trump, the science is on my side, and I'd like to see how your hair would fare in a blizzard. So I wrote back, Donald Trump, the science is on my side, and I'd like to see how your hair would fare in a blizzard. Sometimes, if you haven't noticed, you use a little humor. Like when he called me snow woman at my announcement in the middle of that thing, I wrote back on Twitter, I'd like to see how your hair would fare in a blizzard. So I wrote back, hey, Donald Trump. So I wrote back, uh, hey, Donald Trump. So I wrote back, I wrote back. I tweeted back, the, the science, science is on, on my side. side. And I'd like to see how and your like hair would fare in a blizzard. And I'd like to see how your hair would fare in a blizzard. And I'd like to see how your hair would fare in a blizzard. Mr. Umbrella Man. Mr. Umbrella Man. And he called me Snow Woman. So I wrote back, I'd like to see how your hair would fare in a blizzard. I bet Pete Buttigieg is so relatable yeah. right there. Just stone face. Uh, shout out Determinatus for that great uh, uh, compilation there. I, I just about killed me this morning. Yeah. Just about literally is going to get us all killed. I would like to. Now I want to see a snow woman versus umbrella man uh, general election. Yeah. Oh, shit. It's working on you. So I said, I'd like to see how your hair fares in a blizzard. Mr. Umbrella Man. Mr. Umbrella. You got to do the hand. That's very important. Michael, can you speak to Jeremy Scahill's new piece on Bernie Biden on Iraq? Also, what's with the Intercept reporters and our huge Warren blind spots? How come they don't care about Warren and wouldn't even mention what's happening to their own colleague, Glenn Greenwald? Well, I, for, let me start first. I, every Intercept person I've seen has certainly talked about Glenn, Glenn Greenwald. And my God, I mean, have we done that on this show yet? 
Of course, I mean, yeah, false. We, okay, we mentioned it in Grim. Uh, I, I at least Grim know has. Ryan Grim. Well, I yeah. It. Solidarity with Glenn Greenwald. Incredible courage going up against that regime. Um, you know, look, he could probably figure out a way to leave the country if he wanted. He's not. He's fighting. He's exposed our national security state. He exposed the corruption of Lava Jato. And as always, all solidarity with Glenn Greenwald. It's an incredible fight. Um, uh, you know, look, uh, Warren's blind spots. I don't know, man. I can't. That's a. I can't speak. I'm not going to speculate um, on other people like that. I think um, I keep saying it. Ryan Grimm and I, I thought, had a very thoughtful debate about it on my show. Um, I was extremely diplomatic. Uh I sort of resent how diplomatic I've had to be in some ways, to be honest. Uh, but, um, you know, I can only speak to, to my views on these things. Being uh, right has its own reward. Indeed. Michael, uh, and I have not heard uh, Scahill's piece on that, but it sounds interesting. What is this that we have here? Which one is this? Okay. So this is actually really important, too. Um, this is another thing that Bernie's been right about for a very long time. And is, of course, you know, this, the, when we start talking about what are the weaknesses or what is the actual strategic map of Bernie Sanders in a general election, what we're already seeing in a Democratic primary, a set of a media class that hates this guy. And I think right now we're at the peak of a lot of people who hate him because he either exposes how vapid their politics are, the limits of their vision. They don't like that he, you know, there was somebody trying to make hay at it. Uh, you know, there was that he wasn't a, you know, doesn't have an Ivy League law degree, that he, you know, went to Vermont or what. I mean, you know, again, stuff that most people would find extremely appealing. Thank you. You know, the world is not some weird West Wing script. And then there's also just, you know, the raw material power that's like, yeah, the America's media outlets are owned by Rupert Murdoch, they're owned by Disney, they're owned by GE, they're owned by company, they're owned by Amazon, right? They're owned by Facebook, they're owned by, I'm talking about just even those platforms, Google. These are industries and organizations that want to keep an oligarchy, that want to undermine democracy, that don't want America to have a social system. So they are the enemies of Bernie Sanders and any working class movement in this country. And that's something, and dealing with that, and everybody better be reading their Noam Chomsky and, you know, really understanding how these things work. And I think Bernie Sanders has an understanding of how these things work. This is him in 1998 talking about media consolidation and workers' rights. You turn on CBS. Who owns CBS? Westinghouse. You turn on NBC, owned by General Electric. You turn on ABC, and that's owned by Disney and Mickey Mouse. <laughs> you turn on the Fox television network, and that's owned by that fighting progressive Rupert Murdoch, a right-wing billionaire. And then you have public television, not much different, because they're also controlled by all of the corporate advertising that comes in to those stations. So you step back and you say, let's see, I see a lot about O.J. Simpson, more than we ever wanted to see, right? We see a lot about Princess Diana and her tragic death. We see a lot about President Clinton's sex life. But do we ever see or very often see programs on television that reflect the reality of American working people? The great story of the last 20 years is the decline of the middle class and the fact that the average American is working longer hours for lower wages. Gee, that's a story that CBS seems to have missed. <laughs> See, I think what ends up happening is the average American, and I know in my state, people don't work one job. They work two jobs. Occasionally, they work three jobs. And then they turn on the television, and they hear how the economy is booming. And they get very confused. They say, it must be me. I must be doing something wrong. Because all over America, the economy is booming except for me. Must be me, it's not the system. Think how different it would be if we had, on a regular basis, radio and television programming which talked about the reality facing the American people.
Boom. And that's when Bernie invented podcasting. Yeah, exactly. So I recommend people take their tape recorders and use it. Uh, Check your... I think we've got a very brilliant um, member of the community dug this up. We've got it. This is the Jim Messina ad that he's tried to scrub. 2002, homophobic... And this is Jim Messina, the guy who said Brexit might not, might not be a problem, who has helped the Tories and their ma- extreme xenophobia, their vicious assault on the working class across Britain, who works for Uber, and now says Bernie Sanders can't win. Here's his most memorable ad he's ever made in 2002 for Max Baucus against the guy who's running 20 points behind Max Baucus. State Senator Mike Taylor once ran a beauty salon and a hair care school until the Department of Education uncovered Taylor's hair care scam for abusing the student loan program and diverting money to himself. Abuse that causes innocent students to default on their loans. Abuse that costs taxpayers thousands and lined Taylor's own pockets. Mike Taylor, not the way we do business here in Montana. See the end there? Where look at the way his hand is dropping in Montana. Look, we'll play it again. Oh, really? Just the top line where he says that. Mike Taylor, not the way we do business here in Montana. <laughs> Good job, Jim Messina. And you know what's so great about that is that that's like a the content of that about the student loan scams. That's true. That's like a totally valid attack ad. But the, he's just having fun with just doing like, yeah, let's just do some homophobic yeah. shit. Let's pretend he's jerking the guy off and say we're not doing it. That's not the way we do business here in Montana. With the porn soundtrack. That's Jim Messina. Fuck Jim Messina. Disgusting. Yeah. Um, So I'm going to play this clip. We did an interview with President Lula. I'd also recommend everybody read Lula's Washington Post op-ed on the persecution of Glenn Greenwald. This is a globally synchronized thing. The threat to democracy, the concentration camps at the border, William Barr's vision of eroding American democracy, Republicans' assault on civil rights and voting rights, and what U.S. foreign policy amongst Republicans and Democrats has backed in Brazil and across the globe is feeding an internationally coordinated far right. We need to answer that. And Lula is a key part of that answer for people serious about an actual democratic human-centered politics. And here he's talking about a really little known piece of history, which people should learn more about, which is that in 2010, 2011 or 2010, I believe, uh, Turkey and Brazil negotiated an agreement with the then Iranian president, Ahmadinejad, on the Iranian nuclear program. Very similar to what Obama and uh, other partners would negotiate several years later. And at the time, it was just rejected. And I agree with President Lula's interpretation that essentially it was primarily rejected because the Western order just didn't feel comfortable with a country like Brazil playing that role in international diplomacy. And this is a serious thing. This, that, that, in fact, is about symbolic power, but also material power. And it undermines a genuinely democratic world system, and it snuffs out the profound potential of a much more democratized global order. And he talks here specifically, this is subtitled, so I'll summarize it if you're listening. Please go on Michael Brooks' show YouTube channel and watch the whole interview about Hillary Clinton's role as Secretary of State in undermining it. It's interesting news and, I mean, guys, you can't enough with the Hillary Clinton defense if anybody's still doing that. Na Inglaterra, o Bush, no primeiro momento, era muito simpático, o Obama menos simpático. Ah, ah, e, e quando nós nos propusemos em negociar com a Armadina Jale, foi um fato histórico, porque a gente estava nos Estados Unidos, estava fazendo um encontro ah, do G20, acho que foi em Princeton, ah, e, e eu cheguei na reunião, eu tinha conversado com a Armadina Jale no hotel, ah, eu até então não tinha relação de amizade com a Armadina Jale. Uh, e aí eu cheguei na reunião e perguntei para o Obama se ele já tinha conversado com a Madinejada. Ele falou que não. Perguntei para a Angela Merkel, ela disse que não. Perguntei para o Gordon Brown, ele disse que não. Conversei com o Sarkozy, ele disse que não. Ou seja, na verdade, ninguém tinha conversado com a Madinejada. Ou seja, eu ficava pensando, como é que essa gente quer fazer um acordo se essa gente não conversa? Porque a política internacional está muito terceirizada. 
sobretudo na, na Europa, é muito terceirizada. É, são funcionários que negociam e, e é mais difícil. E eu lembro que quando eu decidi a ir a, ao Irã, a, a Hillary Clinton trabalhou muito contra. Ela chegou a telefonar para o Emir do Catar pedindo para ele me convencer a não ir. Eu cheguei em Moscou, fui encontrar com o Medvedev, o Obama tinha ligado para o Medvedev pedindo para eu não ir, que eu ia ser enganado. Why? Why so concerned? A, apesar disso, veja, apesar disso, o Obama não estava gostando que eu fosse a, 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 ao Irã, mas o Obama fez uma carta a, dizendo que se o Armadinejad concordasse com tais sabe, condições, Uh, para ele estaria bem. Então foi com essa carta que eu viajei para o Irã. E chegamos lá, depois de dois dias de conversa, estava muito difícil, estava muito difícil, eu falei para o Madinejad, eu não vou regressar ao Brasil sem a tua assinatura. Sabe? E ele falou para mim, não, mas não dá para ser acordo de palavra, não dá para ser um acordo verbal. Eu dizia, não dá, porque lá ninguém acredita em vocês. Eles dizem que os iranianos, os iranianos são mentirosos e não cumprem acordo. Então, eu só vou se for por escrito. E ele aceitou o acordo, tal como nós propusemos. E eu fiquei surpreso, porque quando eu imaginava que o Obama ia ficar feliz com o acordo, ele aumentou as sanções contra o Irã. Ah, aí nós descobrimos que o, o Hillary Clinton não tinha conhecimento da carta que o Obama tinha me entregue, porque ela estranhou quando o ministro Celso Amorim falou para ela da carta. Mas eu, eu não tive outra situação a não ser publicar a carta do Obama. So basically his point was was that there was this demand for negotiations with Iran or dealing with the Iran nuclear question but nobody would talk with Ahmadinejad. So he took it upon himself and he actually in another interview he he explained how before when he first met Ahmadinejad he had to clear up whether Ahmadinejad really denied the Holocaust or not. And when Ahmadinejad made clear that he didn't, then he said, "Okay, we can talk now." And um He went to Iran and, along with uh, Turkey, negotiated a very good deal. People should read about it. Um, there was a great Al Jazeera report on the time about uh, the deal he and Celso Amarin, along with Erdogan, negotiated. And that Obama then, instead of being happy, increased sanctions on Iran. And that Hillary Clinton was trying to undermine his, dem his uh, diplomatic efforts every step of the way. Uh, watch the whole interview. Michael Brooks Show YouTube channel. Um, Let's see. Uh, I want to start, let's do a little bit of impeachment stuff. Let's start with clip number six. So this is a great example, by the way, about how the corruption of the Trump administration can be used to make a much broader argument about classification, about transparency, about secrecy, all institutions in government, but of course, most especially the national security state, are overclassified. It's a structural threat to democracy. A vast majority of these things do not pose any type of national security threat. It's not going to risk somebody's life in Afghanistan. It's not the design or the security codes to some nuclear bunker. It's just things that people don't want the public to know. Look at, look at most of the Manning disclosures to Julian Assange, the WikiLeaks. They reveal that the United States is killing civilians across the globe. They reveal dirty diplomatic dealings. They revealed some things that were just interesting. But those things were not in the main. And even today, the most virulent, you know, fear mongers and liars about it cannot actually point to harm. So, and of course, the Trump administration, as with everything, it's always the most crass and stupid and disgusting and ridiculous version of it. And so there's this call, I believe, between Mike Pence and Zelensky that should be part of the proceedings. And Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren, who's one of the House impeachment managers, is telling the Senate, look, I read this and people need to read it. And classification is not to just hide people's, you know, uh, embarrassment. As powerful as our evidence is, and make no mistake, it overwhelmingly approves, uh, approves his guilt. We did not receive a single document from the executive branch agency, including the White House itself. Recent revelations from press reports, Freedom of Information Act requests, and additional witnesses, such as Lev Parnas, 
underscore how relevant these documents and therefore why the president has been so desperate to hide them and his misconduct from Congress and from the American people. A trial without all the relevant evidence is not a fair trial. It would be wrong for you senators acting as judges to be deprived of relevant evidence of the president's offenses when you are judging these most serious charges. It would also be unfair to the American people who overwhelmingly believe the president should produce all relevant documents and evidence. Now, documentary evidence is used in all trials for a simple reason. As the uh, story goes, the documents don't lie. Documents give objective, real-time insight into the... Oh, stop. Well, okay. I mean, no, I think she... Oh, yeah, yeah, keep it going. Such evidence is especially important in Senate impeachment trials. More than 200 years of Senate practice make clear that documents are generally the first order of business. They presented, uh, been presented to the Senate before witnesses take the stand in great volume to ensure the Senate has the evidence it needs to evaluate the case. Now, documentary evidence in Senate trials has never been limited to the documents sent by the House. The Senate, throughout its existence, has exercised its authority pursuant to its clear rules of procedure to subpoena documents at the outset of a trial. We don't know with certainty what the documents will say. We simply want the truth, what, whatever that truth may be. So, so do the American people. They want to know the truth. And so should everybody in this chamber, regardless of our party affiliation. I think I'm thinking of, yeah, there's, there's some mix up there. I think it's something specifically about the Pence call. I mean, the point still stands, and obviously we know that, I mean, Mitch McConnell said there's coordination, I, there's no separate, there's no daylight between what the White House wants and what we're doing. And Mitch McConnell has been the grave digger of American democracy for most of his career, so that makes perfect sense. Uh, this is uh, Fox News, we're deep inside the propaganda bubble, here's what they think. It's we're in Jupiter, Florida. Well, these people are probably not persuadable. Well, after what was said yesterday, we all heard some of the things that was said in the proceedings. You get the screenshot of Schiff and Nadler together, and and you just can't help but look at the two of them standing next to one another and think that's the Democrats' answer to Abbott and Costello. Larry, thank you. And <laughs> so happy with himself i mean the abbott and costello punchline just kills in that room wow no and that's the thing is i'm sitting here embarrassed for him because it's so lame but he fucking crushed it he probably got a couple of numbers yeah to one another and think that's the democrats answer to abbott and costello Larry, thank you and finally sherry take us home quickly you know, five how seconds. many times did he retell that story is is retelling that and then i was on fox and he was there and i said abbott costello and everybody laughed everybody laughed. i wonder if handy saw it quickly five seconds how will history view this time in america history is going to remember donald trump and his family as well for their sacrifices and what he has done for this country <laughs> and they're also going to remember this house this speaker for what the travesty they've done to this country the damage that they've done to this country and the harm across the world they will be remembered yeah that's it here from <laughs> Yeah, that's a real room of mouth-breathing morons. That, gonna, that's a real, like, we're doing our job here, folks. <laughs> they're going to remember everything that me and my family have done to sacrifice, but mainly what I've done, because actually Melania hasn't done a whole lot. Yeah, her. Melania, it was actually it was a big step up for her. She's pretty much an illegal, <laughs> illiterate, illegal immigrant. So but Shout out to yeah, Jupiter. Love shout Jupiter. Shout out to Love Jupiter. It's so true. It's so true. Trump family self-denial. They didn't book out the whole floor? Well, fuck them. V vodka Red Bulls for everybody. <laughs> yeah, vodka Red Bulls for everybody. Oh, my God. It's pathetic. It's so embarrassing. Um, sorry, you guys have it? Oh, 
All right, yes, this is, okay, I guess I should reset it because we can't clip it. I can, I can. Okay, all right, all right. So this is Zoe Lofgren on a similar point. I mean, the first is just about having an actual trial. If you're going to do it, have the actual trial. Of course, Mitch McConnell's not going to allow that. And then this is specifically with regards to a call involving Mike Pence. By the committee to declassify Williams' addendum so the American people could also see the additional evidence about this call. We urge the senators to review it, and we ask again that the White House declassify it. As the House wrote in two separate letters, there is no basis to keep it classified. And again, in case the White House needs a reminder, it's improper to keep something classified just to avoid embarrassment. <laughs> I love her smirk at the end. It's a lot of alpha energy right there. Remember that recently we found uh, uncovered or I guess decent un decensored uh, that clip of Reagan talking to Nixon and basically yes. saying like Africans just learned how to wear shoes. Yes. That was censored to uh, the initial reasoning was for privacy of the family. So, right. Um, this sort of, I mean, I totally agree. And I think, um, you know, we left shouldn't fall in this trap of saying like law, nothing matters. Now is the time to pr like force this stuff. I really hope we get some documents from Trump. I'd like to see, frankly, just William Barr's entire office seized. Oh, uh, we need, to, I mean, William, right. William Barr is the biggest threat. Exactly. So like William I, Barr is the biggest threat. I mean, I, I we got to push for transparency, and, and what transpa transparency should just mean a fancy way of seizing documents from these motherfuckers. Absolutely, and if you want to look, read about Trump, read about Trump and the mafia, read about Trump in the '80s, all of that stuff. Absolutely, but still, if you want to understand the Republican Project, and you want us to understand William Barr, you have to read Democracy in Chains. That is still the definitive book, and there was, you know, I think in today's world that book would be less bothered. In the sense that a bunch of, you know, whiny libertarians were all offended because that book exposed that their ideology is just purely the handmaiden of oligarchs and it is and in segregation fact, and segregation and anti-democracy and everything else that's bad. And then you had a bunch of like, you know, uh, the same like wuss bag weenie liberals who probably today would, you know, either be saying that, you know, you shouldn't criticize Biden because Trump or maybe you've had a complete 180 and all of a sudden you can't, you know, talk to tens of millions of their fellow Americans because they've decided they're evil or whatever other, you know, pathologies have been developed were they gave so much space to compromise Nancy McLean's scholarship by being like, well, you know, my friend who blogs at the Kano blog about why, you know, getting rid of us, uh, uh, if we if we actually let people smoke and sign again, it would actually reduce traffic deaths. Completely poisoning said, the search yeah. results. If you if you yes. search that book, all that crap, and I went over this on my literary hangover yes. episode, of, but like all Listen that crap it. is completely at the top of the results, and that book stands up. And you know why? Nothing else has come from their side from these nerd like libertarian side to say like actually she's wrong about this it's just these blog posts and you know wanker saying man q really really got into uh nancy mclean with this blog post and it's like okay man yeah and it's like okay you you know some figure like buchanan you have a quote where he says like actually i oppose legal segregation okay the whole point of the book and what she documented was that all of you people advised segregationists yeah. so okay Great. You, per you know, sure, maybe you personally opposed Pinochet machine gunning people to death in soccer stadiums. You were there advising him about how to get rid of people's social security. Shut up. That book is still, yes, it is one of the, if not the most, that's how you understand libertarians. That's how you understand the Republican project. Nancy McLean, Democracy in Chains. And that's why you understand someone like Bill Barr is the enemy of democracy. And of course he's willing to lie. And of course he's willing because to. Because there are people that are conscious they need to be that. Yes. Like, that is their political projects. <laughs> that is what they are trying to do. I mean, look, if you want to even, if you want to even look at it in a more sophisticated way, I, I think uh, Christopher Codwell, extreme, very right wing, you know, the, the sort of friendly... The, the intellectual, uh, you know, defender of Trumpism. His new book, I, I was reading a review, it posits that really the, that the civil rights move, revolution and uh, the original constitution are in tension. 
in terms of and and I think he's and I think there's a missing gap there, which I don't know how he addresses with the idea that at least conceptually, definitely Lincoln is a second founding. Yeah. There's no doubt. I totally believe in that. But that's a respectable intellectual framework. And you got it, you know, there's a lot of distinctions between culture and policy and all the stuff you have to make that gets really thorny. But the really bottom line, simple top line point is that people like Bill Barr do not support democracy as is conventionally understood, including even by quite moderate people. And people should be very aware of that. And that's why they can synchronize, you know, this this dingbat moron president and his narcissism and his personal appetites and desires because it syncs with their project. This is Steve Mnuchin. He's at Davos and he's talking climate change. Jesus Christ, this is one of the this is one of the most repulsive freeze frames I've ever seen. And we haven't even gotten to the clip yet. So the, is the current, we've got a two-year or a five-year window to prevent the total demise of, of civilization? It is, I mean, is it, do you believe that we're that close? No, to- no, I, I don't believe we're that close. And what I would just comment is there are a lot of other important issues. Obviously, this health issue and what's going on, the potential of, of health issues spreading, uh, nuclear but proliferation. Clean air. Uh, if you look at the virus in a, China. There's a virus coming out of China, which, by the way, Taken on their own terms, the Trump administration, along with, I mean, after the Clinton era, too, I mean, global public health has been starved of funding, uh, Medicare for all, uh, investing in, you know, global public health. Obviously, Trump administration not doing that. And climate change. I don't know about this this flu, although I, I would assume if it comes from agriculture, that definitely has something to do with climate and ecological policies. And the spread of other diseases have to do with, um, you know, things like malaria outbreaks definitely re- relate to climate and, uh, and, and, and disease outbreaks in cities. I think uh, Mnuchin's concern with the, uh, neuro- the virus going around China is uh, the cities that are not transporting goods and the workers that aren't going to the factories. Oh, without a doubt. And also just like, yeah, me, my wife keeps hassling me to, uh, to get a bunker for us in New Zealand, okay? Of, of health issues spreading, uh, nuclear but proliferation. Clean air, uh, if you look particulate at, pollution. If you look at the water. Middle East, the president has made very clear Iran can never have a nuclear weapon. Mm-hmm. Nothing against the climate issue. That's a much better risk. Uh, it's much bigger risk right. today. And I think that the youth needs to understand climate is one issue that needs to be put but, in but context me, with lots of... Wait, Iran's going to destroy civilization Iran is with a nuclear bomb? With a nu- something they don't have which they're, we are an infinitely bigger threat to them than they are to us, is a bigger threat than something that to the extent we can measure it or have any type of scientific consensus, as well as just experience now, because we're already experiencing climate catastrophes, um, threatens the very basis upon which humans walk around. Coming is like, well, you pull out the Iran deal. I guess we just have to destroy the world with a nuke now. That's, that's exactly that's how right. Iran operates. Yeah, that's how Iran operates, and they totally have the physical capacity to do that. But again, th- their ideology dictates that this is what they do. If you are want to do capitalism, you have to deny science. And by the way, it makes most democratic plans totally incoherent. Sorry, Brendan Sutton made this point the other day on my show. If you're going to run around and say, we accept the science, well, if you accept the science, you can't drill anymore. You have to completely, you have to rapidly de- deploy renewables. You need to build train systems. You need to reforest. You, I mean, these things need to happen immediately. So just culturally signifying that you accept science while continuing to do capitalism is completely incompatible. Capitalism is on a collision course of planet Earth. And so, you know, this, the sociopathy of Mnuchin is true. It's it's correct. And we all know, again, when the right starts, quote, accepting the science of climate, well, we'll have a whole other round of violence against migrants and refugees. So please look at the bigger picture here. France is still on it. Emmanuel Macron, which was going to be the savior, he was going to be the answer. Remember, he was going to be the answer to Donald Trump while these MSNBC types were saying a couple of years ago. Well, he's less popular than Donald Trump. And they are not accepting his efforts to destroy the hard-fought accomplishments 
um, that have been achieved in France. They're really real. Here are people. This is Eric Blanc. Our buddy Eric Blanc has some video footage of firefighters on strike in France lying down in the street in protests of attacks on their pensions. This is incredibly powerful. I mean, the most positive news in the world of 2019, obviously, I mean, Bernie Sanders, that campaign moving and growing, hugely significant, the most significant thing in the United States. And then globally, I mean, obviously, U.S. presidential election is important globally, but the uprisings, Haiti, Chile, Lebanon, Iran, France, Ecuador, these are could not be more important. All right, let's keep going here. Try to sneak in a few more calls. You're calling from a 920 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Uh, this is Joe from Wisconsin. Hey, Joe from Wisconsin. What's up? How you doing? I was wondering if you've read the book, uh, The Dictator's Handbook. No. Oh, okay. I don't have to frame this a bit differently. Um, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, essentially, the the thesis of the book is uh, goes into that uh, the power given or that governments behave more poorly when they have less people that they are beholden to. Right. Mm -hmm. And. It's that that is that's the main reason it's not, you know, whether they whether they believe more in capitalist things or socialist things or that the less people that are necessary for the leader to stay in power or the leaders group to stay in power, the more harsh they are on the people mm -hmm. going from autocracy to democracy. Okay. I mean, I, I have some questions with that. I have some pretty big question marks with that premise. But, I mean, again, I haven't read the book. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, okay. And it and it even goes into that uh, the main purpose of – the main purpose of foreign aid tends to be uh, – what do you call it? Smaller, essentially – cheaper versions of getting policy that larger governments that are more beholden to their people, you know, democracies, that the reason why foreign aid tends to go to more places that are led by, uh, you know, led by autocrats tends to be that it's cheaper to support, it's cheaper to support the autocrat to get, you know, a military base in a place to, you know, show that we're protecting yeah, against so terrorism. Just, okay, so, so just give me the question here, Joe. Okay. Um, the basic question was that, well, I don't know if it's a question so much as a statement, that mm -hmm. the, the way that uh, uh, Bernie Sanders is, you know, rejecting, uh, well, and Warren, to a certain extent, is rejecting corporate uh, money and monies like that mm -hmm. is just just so much of a, you know, it it helps turn back and all of all of the way that we are going towards more and more getting closer and closer to, you know, like autocracy. autocracy and I autocracy, agree. Autocracy. I mean, I, I totally agree. I agree. And I think it's an look, got to get rid of Donald Trump. But to the extent that people don't see that getting rid of these broader conditions are essential because it's not a person, it's a trend. It's not a personality. It's a historical circumstance. It's really important. I appreciate the call, man. Thanks. You're calling from a Skype. Hello. Skype. Hello. Are you there? Skype. No. You're calling from a 612 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hi, this is Mitchell from Minneapolis. Hey, Mitchell. What's going on? 
Hey, so I have a roommate who um, basically said if he could make Bernie Sanders dictator for life, and he would, and loves all his policies and stuff, cool. right? Mm -hmm. But he um, he says he doesn't think he can get anything done. Why are like people laughing Senate. after the third week of the month? That's illegal. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I'm going to remake the calendars uh, with Jade's face on them. All right. I'm sorry. I, I went off on a whim <laughs> there. Okay. So he doesn't think I, he can get anything done. Okay. And uh, like mm -hmm. he can't get anything done with the Republican Senate and can't work with other Democrats. And he thinks like Pete Buttigieg would be better or maybe even Elizabeth Warren. So what would you say to that criticism? All right. I would say to the, that number one, a lot, and this has to change, but a lot of what a president will get done initially is through staffing and executive orders. And Bernie Sanders has by far, infinitely, it's not in the same space, the most progressive and left staff and policy plans as well as personal politics. So that's number one. Two, uh, I mean, with regards to Buttigieg, I mean, I don't know what he wants to get done, but Buttigieg isn't even planning or pretending to try to get serious progressive reform done. So, I mean, I don't know. If, look, if he just wants to get things done for things done sake, uh, I guess. But if he's serious about anything, um, you know, Buttigieg is not on the left at all. Um, and neither really is Warren. I mean, frankly, if you care about healthcare as an example, Let's simplify it. I don't know what his main issue is, but let's just take health care. The funny thing about health care is that even Joe Biden's proposal of like a serious public option, which I think is basically Buttigieg's proposal too, which is the most insufficient conservative, would still leave millions of people out of the system, is still not solve the problem fundamentally. This is still totally unpassable right now. If you're just looking at it as like a horse trading game, right? Like, the pharmaceutical insurance industries still have way too much power. Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema are not voting for that, just as they're not voting for Medicare for All. Every single Republican is going to vote against it, just as they'll vote against uh, Medicare for All. And there's plenty of other corporate Democrats, and there's going to be huge you know, industry campaigns against any expansion of, of public health. It's a different dynamic. When Obama came into office... He was able to neutralize some of that industry support because at the end of the day, it was an incredibly industry friendly bill. <laughs> like you look, you have to accept patient protections. That was definitely something they had to swallow. But in response, people are going to be mandated to buy a commercial project product and then the government will subsidize it. Great. Bunch more money in customers. And then for people that they really don't want to have uh you know, poor people and people on the margins, they got a Medicaid expansion, which, you know, they don't care about that much one way or another. I mean, they want to help administer these programs and that adds all sorts of inefficiencies, but like they don't, they don't want poor marginal people as clients because they can't make money off of them. And they aren't necessarily particularly committed to, you know, making sure that Medicaid doesn't cover some people, right? Yeah. Giving a public health option even in a time where they're making record, record profits and totally comfortable threatens their business model enough for them to go to war against it. And it's not a big enough and persuasive enough vision uh, and not – and I doubt, frankly, Biden or Buttigieg would even push for it to begin with to mobilize people to resist against Congress. Then Warren – same thing. She doesn't have the movement. She doesn't have the mobilization. And then she's got this, uh, you know, this Rube Goldberg thing where we're going to have two historical fights on health care. And then presumably the first one, which would be even harder to pass because the first part of her plan is way more generous and better than what Biden and Buttigieg are passing are trying to pass. And then somehow after that happens, which it won't happen, then we're going to pass the most controversial and difficult part of it namely phasing out private health insurance predators in the third year of my presidency during a reelection campaign. I mean, it's again, it's it, in my opinion, it's so ridiculous and unrealistic that we can safely say this is not somebody who supports Medicare for all. Some people still don't like that, still will get offended, blah, 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 blah. I'm just telling you what my opinion is. Then in yeah. Bernie Sanders well, case, then in Bernie Sanders case, you know, again, he's really transparent and your friend just has to say to himself, if I support all these things, 
And it really is not that hard to just chip a vote off. Go for the proposition. It's a proposition. We don't know if it will work. The funny thing is, though, is that we know all these other things won't work. We have a theory of change. It's the only one left. It's a moonshot. It's going to be hugely hard. Sorry to say people are going to need to work even harder after he's elected than before. And maybe you can create enough pressure outside to see if this is still a functioning democracy. But every other scenario, yeah. that isn't what's happening. So you're either basically talking about putting somebody in office like Buttigieg, who I have no doubt will not even pursue progressive principles and progressive ideas, would, I'm sure, happily collaborate with the Republicans on any number of destructive things, like Biden. Warren, who I don't even, you know, I, 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 at this point, I'm not even clear what the actual push would be uh, in the first term and does not have a movement behind her. And then Sanders. And he, if he supports him, then great. He already knows the policy. And, you know, he'll use the executive branch and the staffing in the most effective and the most left way. And then we'll see. That's it. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. You're welcome, man. Thanks for the call. I, I don't understand this kind of like it's mental weird, like, block about like it, even if you don't think it could happen, like, OK, so go take a half hour and vote. And then I don't know if it doesn't happen, you're no like wh I don't know what people think they're losing. It's a very weird argument. It's weird to me, like when people they, they light along up upon something that might be true and might be an, a real obstacle, like the whole like Senate or the judiciary. Course, right. And then you course. say, but Pete Buttigieg is going to solve that problem. I, I don't understand. It's like, okay, so then vote for somebody who will like not, you know, will not do anything. I, I don't know. It just doesn't, it, it just, uh, yeah, it's, it's a very weird line of argumentation. It, se it, I, it seems like something better for a therapist or a psychologist. Um, you're calling from a 707 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Hey, Michael, this is Blaine. How's it going? Hey, Blaine, what's going on? What's on your mind? Well, first off, I just wanted to say it's my birthday, so I got to keep this call brief. I'm expecting a call from Bernie Sanders. <laughs> okay. What else you got? Happy birthday. <laughs> hey, thanks. Um, so uh, thanks to your show and shows like uh, Secular Talk and Progressive Voice, I'd like to think I've become a, a, an adept political debater. But uh, that being said, I still have yet to convince a couple of my friends that they should vote for uh, Senator Sanders and not Mr. Yang. Could you come up with a cool and concise argument for why maybe they should consider switching their vote? Uh, Bernie's cooler than Andrew Yang. He has a chance of winning. He could. Yeah, I mean, honestly, at this point, if you look, if you if you're just looking at the real world a little bit and you actually like both of these guys, one of them could actually become president. And the other guy, if you think his if you think his ideas are cool and you like him, I mean, Andrew Yang will be around. He'll start a podcast, and it'll be better for know? his brand if he endorses Bernie. So uh, get your friend to tell him to do that. You know, that's the thing. You should be telling Andrew Yang to get in the mix by endorsing Bernie. That would be definitely and, uh, the most strategic. It's thing good for, him for Tulsi, to do. definitely. And maybe in a uh, a Sanders presidency, what kind of a role do you see Andrew Yang playing? Do you I think he would get a position in the? government i can't lie i mean i don't probably not but i think that um put him on a task force yeah, on ubi maybe yeah why not you know what that's bernie could say like hey let's do a ubi task force to examine the feasibility of it and how it relates to automation uh, automation and other things we need to do like medicare for all and jobs guarantee i think that yeah why not i actually i honestly if i was advising sanders that is exactly what i tell him to do is suggest a UBI task force headed up by Andrew Yang that is, he should do that. Yeah. Can you guys see yourself playing a role in his, uh, his government? Yeah, Michael secretary of state. Yeah. Secretary of state. I'll, I'll be there. Um, I'll be, uh, I'll be learning Portuguese. All right, man. Thanks so much for the call. Take care, buddy. Hey, thanks for having me. Bye. Uh, I do not see a role for myself in the Sanders administration. I'm going to keep agitating from the outside. We will be propagandizing on the outside. All right, final call of the day. You're calling from a 647 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? 647, are you hey, there? Seven. Hey, it's a really eight? bad connection, man. I'm sorry. All right. Yeah, you got to try back. Sorry. It's like radio right. static. Sorry about that. that that's, I apologize, but it's just really bad. Got to consider.
folks experience calling in here. Um, you're calling from a final call today. Sorry, random pick. You're calling from a 208 area code. Who are you? Where are you calling from? Uh, hey, this is Sean calling from Blackfoot, Idaho. Hey, Sean. Greetings to Idaho. How are you? Uh, I'm okay. I mean, my uh, sitting senator is a bit of a turd. Uh, he fell asleep the other day during the impeachment trial. <laughs> right. So, yeah. I'm sitting here with his response letter from January 8th. I've uh, been uh, calling him about remaining impartial and all that. So uh, he sits here. Senator James, James Risch sits on the Energy, Natural Resources, Foreign Relations, Select Committee on Ethics, right. Select Committee on Intelligence, and Small Business and Entrepreneurship. Right. I hear a lot about money going into other races that seem really important. But I want to encourage people to look into alternative candidates, Democratic candidates here in Idaho, because okay. Senator James Risch is the second most powerful senator uh, as far as political rankings in the Senate right now. And he was one of the people that kept the bombings in Yemen continuing. He is not at all critical of the Saudi government. And when he does, it's a slap on the wrist. And uh, here during the impeachment thing, he says that uh, the Constitution describes the crimes for which the president may be impeached as high crimes and misdemeanors, in quotes. He completely leaves out the other portion of uh, Article 3 or Article 2 which is, you know, the whole treason and bribery thing. And this has been the uh, uh, norm for the GOP for a long time. So let's find, and, uh, let's find somebody, and I would recommend look up, uh, you know, my friend Luke Mayville is an amazing organizer in Idaho, and he's not running for office or anything, but he's done a, he spearheaded the Medicaid expansion, and there's definitely... I help with that. Awesome. Yeah. Well, there's definitely he, he, energy. Luke is amazing. Exactly. There's Co definitely energy there. Caller, Matt, do you quick. have, uh, Ballotpedia has three Democrats here. It says Nancy Harris, Travis Oler, and James Vandermass. Is any one of those three uh, head and shoulders above the other? Nancy, Nancy would be preferable. Uh, in my research, she uh, has the strongest climate platform. She's pro-labor. She was a portion of the NAACP. Uh, she's right on most of the issues. She's the most right candidate uh, as far as Idaho is concerned. Uh, the others are putting on an okay show, but they seem fairly out of uh, touch of what Idaho needs to progress. So we can get out of these damn headlines for ridiculous crap. Sean, appreciate and it. And make the country we've better. The, we've, got the, we've got the option there. Follow up on it and uh, talk to you soon. Thanks, man. Unfortunately, it looks like a safe uh, Republican. Uh, no, I mean, it's going to be a battle, but yeah. why not? Go I for mean, it. Yeah. Why not? Let's take a dent out of them. All right, read a few IMs, then we're done. Buddha Judge's laugh sounded like Krusty on that clip from yesterday. I never saw Trevor mention, no one mention it, and f I felt validated. Jayhawks, second message, testing, testing, Michael Rux. Oh, thank you. Uh, Michael's. I don't know what that is. Sam really wants to see himself represented on TV shows. <laughs> it is funny how all of the examples are always like, well, what, what about you? What, what, what about you, you, you going for sex in the city? <laughs> uh, okay, let's see. Um, there's a lot of frustration about the smears over Bernie Bowen last week, but there's nothing worse than his continued Bernie Bowen narrative that his uh, surrogates are toxic. Name him, call him out, but cherry picking random uh, online examples is incredibly disingenuous. Yes, of course. All right, Angel. Um, the, the, why is my glove? Oh, am I in Fight Club? No, I just have super sensitive skin. Although I actually am learning a little bit of boxing, which is interesting, but I cannot. I mean, that's not because of that. Uh, let's see. 
sorry. Okay, just racing through a few here. All right, Bullprog, Minnesota should Minnesotans should vote early and now. You can vote now already. Go vote for Bernie Sanders in Minnesota. Come on, Minnesota. Come on, Minnesota. Go join buses going to Iowa for Bernie this weekend. I went last weekend through a blizzard. And I le- it legit impresses me how motivated to see so much people, to see motivated volunteers. It would Bullprog, break. Bullprog, amazing. All props to you. Please stay safe. We do not want anybody getting hurt. I saw, I believe I saw Bullprog's post. I think they posted on Twitter. And it looked terrifying to me, that level of blizzard. But it is oh, amazing I love that stuff. people going out. For Bernie like that. Uh, also, Minnesota, uh, if anyone's in Minnesota, if you're listening, I am of that state. Uh, I hope it never goes red. And the way Keith Ellison won the last election uh, f- um, comfortably was a really good sign to me. I hope that keeps up in 2020. Absolutely. All right. Sorry. A bunch of these that we're not getting to. All right. Final I am of the day. Um, okay, really quick. JJ Cool. Hey, Michael, I've heard plenty of dumb arguments about getting things done today. Anything that establishment candidates always get done is going to come with a cost to us. They're always going to be negotiated with corporate power and Republicans. Bernie's rallying and organizing is far, far better for more people. Absolutely. We will see you tomorrow. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. In that sake, I'll strength that guy to get to where I want. But I know. I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in And my power